uh, through us. So yeah, um, I will turn it over to Anthony now. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think this is the seventh time I've done this. So very excited to be back. Love the huge room. Thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, I assume you know you're here to talk about real estate investing fundamentals. That's what I'm all about. <clears throat> um, my name is Anthony Walker. If you haven't met me before, I'm the chair of the Student Relations Committee for the LMU Real Estate Advisory Council. So um, beyond just being the instructor for this class, um, I'm happy to talk to students, meet with students, um, donate my time to just help you understand what the real estate industry looks like, all your different options. I'm kind of plugged into lots of different parts of it, especially on the kind of more individual uh, investor type roles. I'm not too involved with like institutional real estate type stuff, but I kind of know how some of that fits together too. Um, if you're curious on careers, um, <clears throat> That one. Got it. Like a battery trick. Uh, we're frozen. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I work with a company called Buckingham Investments. I am the CEO and managing broker. Uh, we are a local, mostly multifamily uh, real estate investment brokerage company here in LA. Our office, our main office is in Torrance. Uh, we have a little satellite office in El Segundo, and we had one in Long Beach, but we closed it recently. Uh, thank you, since we turned it into an ADU, which we can talk about if you want to. Um, but lots of fun. A little bit about me, uh, by way of background, I moved out to California from Minneapolis in 2000. For undergrad, I went to USC, uh, and I worked almost 10 years in the insurance industry out of undergrad doing claims. So I was one of those guys that drove around and wrote estimates on busted up cars and stuff like that. Interesting job, but really hard. And you probably were not ever gonna really get ahead doing that kind of work. Uh, so I came here to LMU to get my MBA and figure out what to do with myself. I really wanted to open a business for myself and be in charge of my own time, my own finances, my own growth but I really didn't know what to do. So I didn't come to the MBA program here kind of like knowing what I wanted to do. I wanted to figure it out. Uh, while I was here, I took the real estate investing class that we have right here at the school. Uh, I think that's available at the undergraduate undergraduate program still. Uh, and that ignited my interest in real estate. And I thought, great, it's right here in the textbook, how you make money. I don't have to like invent anything or learn how to code. I'm not like a computer science guy. I don't have to write an app or anything like that. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to invest in buildings and uh, that's going to be my business. The problem is in order to invest in buildings, you need money. And so that can be problematic for some people. Uh, so at the time I was still at my, uh, at my W2 job in insurance. So I started buying small properties with um, the knowledge that I had here. And through my network at LMU, I met a company called Buckingham Investments, which I run now. Uh, and they were all, they've been focused on local individual real estate investing here in LA since 1960s. So that really spoke to me. Their whole approach was all about education. Our founder, Jack Buckingham, started the company because he believed if everyone understood how real estate investing worked, everyone would invest. But there was no good programs out there. There, were no, there was no good support for people who wanted to get into the business. It was kind of like a old boys club and, and to a lot of a big extent it kind of still is so i really liked that business model they weren't doing much with the company at that point in time um, i became a client first and bought uh, a little duplex in long beach to get started with them and then I, I slowly added to my portfolio over time after a while i quit my day job went to work with buckingham as an agent and then i started helping my friends family clients invest in properties and then I would use my commission income to buy more properties. So that ended up being kind of like my main business thesis was I would have these two complementary businesses, my brokerage business for the day job to generate commissions, make money, and then use that to invest in real estate, grow a portfolio for myself. So eventually I could be financially independent. <clears throat> that was a little while ago. So uh, along the way, uh, 
became a broker, opened our Torrance office, and then eventually I took over as the CEO of the company. The original founders are uh, retired or are no longer with us. And so I've continued what the company's always been about, helping people learn, uh, plan, and eventually invest in real estate. So at the end of the day, we are a brokerage company. We make money from commissions. But what kind of sets us apart from a lot of the other brokerage companies is their focus is mostly just like marketing. You're just trying to meet as many people as you can, do as, as many transactions as you can, and that's that, that's the path. That's kind of the standard way to do brokerage. You know, our method is really more about doing kind of what we're doing today, but also with people that could be potential clients. So I do things like teach seminars, put out videos, go on podcasts. We have a bunch of written materials, things like that. And you know, the idea is if we can teach people how this works a little bit, get them comfortable with investing, they're probably going to want to work with us in their brokerage relationship, and we can help them buy buildings. And that's great for everybody involved. And it's not that super hardcore, hard, you know, high pressure, cold call type environment that you see in a lot of brokerages. So I really liked that. And that's worked really well for me. Uh, the slide's out of date. I have 22 properties now, about 175 units, uh, mostly Long Beach, but yeah, all kind of right in Southern LA County. Um, so you also don't have to go out of state to make money. Uh, and this has been a really effective way for me to develop my business, kind of the two, the two silos there, right? The active income, day job, selling properties and helping people invest in properties, and then taking the chips off the table where I can and buying stuff for myself too. So that has some amazing tax advantages as well. We can get into that if you want. Um, <clears throat> as far as LMU goes, I mentioned I'm the chair of student relations. So uh, please attend all of the events, go to the real estate society stuff. I love the momentum that we have here regarding real estate in school. Right now, when I was here, none of this existed. There was no real estate society. There was no real estate advisory council. There was no certificate program. So I really appreciate the support. We put a lot of work into putting these certificate program courses together. Uh, and this is definitely the biggest showing that we've seen yet. So. Uh, really encouraged to see what we have going on here. The more support that we have for stuff like this, the easier it makes it for me to go out to my colleagues in the industry and recruit for the Real Estate Advisory Council and get you more exposure to more professionals, more knowledge, more introductions, more opportunities potentially for jobs. So uh, really appreciate your attendance today. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Uh, we do do internships at Buckingham. Uh, and we usually have a few LMU students there every semester. So we have two right now. They just started this week and we had some over the summer too. So a lot of fun. Uh, we're usually, a we were a stop on the bus tour last year too when we started that. So maybe you'll get a chance to come by our office in October too if you want to do that. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. <clears throat> uh, let's get into the meat of it. So uh, I like to start at the very beginning. This is fundamentals, right? So although I am a, a multifamily investor, there is a huge menu of options when it comes to real estate investing. You can do a lot. That's kind of what I love about the business. You can be involved uh, at the acquisition side. You can be involved in brokerage. You can own properties. You can do property management. You can do taxation. You can do debt. You can do finance. You can do development. You can do a million things. Uh, so that, I always thought that was really cool. There's kind of an unlimited potential for creativity and crafting your own career and deciding where you go with in real estate. But at the end of the day, most people, you're kind of divided into um, a few different camps and categories. So I always like to go over that with people if you haven't really been exposed to anything related to uh, real estate investing before. So first of all, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, biggest advantage, I think, is, is that it's a hard asset. When you own real estate, you own a physical piece of property, which means you have control, which is totally different from a lot of other types of investments. You know, if you buy a uh, stock, if you buy a share of NVIDIA, do you think Mr. Wong is going to listen to your opinion on his earnings call? Probably not, right? You're just rolling the dice and hoping you get another 300,000% upside over the next 10 years. I don't know if that's likely or not, probably not. Uh, I don't really, but uh, with real estate, it's totally your decision what you do with your investment. Like if you have a piece of property, you decide what it rents for, you can improve it yourself, you can change it, you can sell it, you can refinance it, you determine who rents from you, how much you charge, how it's financed, all kinds of stuff. So that control, to me, is more valuable than anything that you can get in most other investment types. 
Same idea, you know, buying cryptocurrency, zero control, right? Most stocks, zero control. Even private equity, nearly zero control unless you have a huge portion uh, invested in that company and a seat on the board, right? When you own a piece of property, you are the board. So you can do everything. I think that's the single biggest advantage to real estate. You get multiple sources of return, which we'll go over today, uh, which makes it really attractive uh, on a numbers basis. You get yield plus appreciation and amazing tax benefits, which a lot of other investment types don't offer. Um, you also can get passive income and growth of principal potential. So that passive income number is kind of the big buzzword a lot of people talk about. I'm sure you're on Instagram or whatever. That's the holy grail, right? Everybody wants to invest their money so they get enough passive income so you don't have to work anymore. And then your toes in the sand, you're chill, right? So yes, that is possible. Uh, no, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work to get there. You got to build a portfolio over time, but it is definitely doable. And then you can get, you get both, right? You also get appreciation. Um, another thing I love about real estate that I remember this being pointed out to me in the original class I took here is it's highly local and fragmented business. So like, if you think about buying a stock, let's say NVIDIA, because I'm going to pick on them again, right? Everybody knows you can buy that. Anyone in the world can log into their brokerage account and buy a share. And the price that you pay at that moment is absolutely the market price, right? By definition, because it's a nearly perfect market. Everybody can participate there. With real estate, <clears throat> it's totally opposite. It's an imperfect market. Transactions take time to go through. Sometimes they don't get public exposure. Uh, people that know a local area or a certain property type or have relationships in an area or know something about a particular building that somebody else doesn't has a competitive advantage against people that might just be looking at a property on Zillow or something like that. So the ability to like really know the local area, really know a property type, you can do, you can outperform relatively easily just by having some specialized knowledge versus buying something that's totally commoditized like a stock. So I love that. Uh, and then the financing's uh, great with real estate compared to other types of, of assets that you can invest in. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about financing today because that's a hot topic these days. The, the financing world has upended the real estate market over the last few years. Um, and I've got some, some new slides that um, I didn't show last time to kind of show what that did to the market. Uh, disadvantages, the biggest one is that it's an illiquid investment. <clears throat> so you buy a house, investment property, land, duplex, retail building, whatever. Great. If you need to sell it, you have to call a guy like me. We have to negotiate a commission. We have to get the marketing materials already. We have to put it on the market. We have to gather offers, see who's willing to come to the table. We have to do walkthroughs. We have to accept one. We have to do due diligence. They have to get financing. We have to get through escrow. We probably renegotiate the deal two or three times. And then maybe if you're lucky, it closes and you get your money two to three months later. So, and if the market's no good, you're probably not selling your property. So uh, highly illiquid investment, that can get people in a lot of trouble. You cannot log into your brokerage account and click sell and be done. There's a couple scenarios where you can do that these days, but to do that, usually you click sell and you lose a whole bunch of principal because those guys are trying to make it so easy for you to click sell that you're going to fire sale something. I don't recommend it. Uh, so very illiquid. That can create problems for people. It's got a management burden. So, you know, again, unlike just buying something that sits in your brokerage account or a Bitcoin or something like that, you have a real building that has plumbing and electrical and a roof, and you have people that probably want power and flush toilets and a dry place to sleep. So sometimes the elements don't agree with you there and things have to be done. Uh, there's a lot to be done, right? You have to lease your units out. You've got to remodel them. You've got to do the accounting. You've got to fix it when stuff breaks. You have to decide what happens. So that management burden is not something to be taken lightly. It can be outsourced, but that has to be accounted for too. And that turns a lot of people off from the business. I remember my dad, um, he was an attorney. He was a bankruptcy attorney. And he had a client paid him by giving him a duplex when I was a kid in the 80s. And uh, I remember on Saturdays, we would often drive to the duplex and I would sit in the car with the window down while he went in and wrestled with fixing an appliance or doing whatever. He hated that duplex. The day he sold that duplex was the best day of his ownership experience in that duplex. And that's a more typical experience for a lot of people that own investment properties. Uh, it's really easy to glorify how this looks. 
on social media, and the reality is not glamorous at all. So uh, it turns a lot of people off, but if you can figure out how to get around that, or you could subcontract that into effective management, you can do well. And then of course, the high barrier to entry. So what does that mean? Uh, you also can't very well invest 10 bucks in real estate. You can't very well invest a hundred bucks in real estate. You're probably investing more like $100,000 in real estate to get started. If you're owner occupying a property, maybe $50,000, something like that. So uh, it takes relatively big chunk of money to get started. Uh, a lot of people have tried to crack that nut as well over the last few years with some of these things like crowdfunding platforms and syndications and ways that you can invest fractionally in deals. Those methods have gotten a lot of people into a lot of trouble, and lost people a lot of money too, so you have to be careful there. A lot of due diligence has to be done on that stuff. Uh, but generally you know, speaking, when you're gonna buy a piece of property yourself, you have to plop down a big down payment, whether that comes from you or a pool of investors is something that you have to get around. Uh, however, returns in real estate versus alternative investments, I believe that real estate is the single best ability to get a super high risk adjusted return versus your alternatives. It is perfectly reasonable to expect a 15 to 30% annualized return on a real on your equity in a real estate portfolio over your ownership experience versus stocks, maybe 10%, right? Bonds, five to 6%, mutual funds, 8%, something like that. Uh, these averages are old, but um, you can really outperform. So if you're willing to get into it, if you know how time value money works and you play around with the financial calculator, uh, it's really powerful. Okay, so uh, within real estate, so that's that's kind of why real estate, right? That's why I like the category in general. Uh, within real estate, you've got what we call asset classes. Who's heard of that before? A couple, only a couple. Okay, awesome. So if you want to sound really fancy at the next party you go to, or I'm sure you're talking about real estate investing, talk about what asset class you're interested in. That's what we all that's what we all say at seminars to sound fancy. Uh, so asset classes generally, you have residential real estate. You have commercial real estate, and then you have land. Within commercial real estate, the asset classes, the biggest ones would be multifamily, office, industrial, and retail. And then there's some subcategories you hear within there, hospitality, which would be like hotels, um, you know, what else, and specialty, things like that. Uh, people would argue self-storage is its own asset class, mobile home parks, that kind of stuff is pretty, has been popular over the last few years. So, you know, you're, the general type of property you're investing in is an asset class. Single family rentals, I would call its own asset class too. Interestingly, single family rentals were like frowned upon by the investment kind of community for decades. Um, I remember in the class I took here, the, the professor said, single family rentals are not investment grade property, uh, which I, I get. Wall Street sort of changed their mind on that topic since I took that class. And now these days you have big hedge funds and uh, large companies buying and building big portfolios of single family, single family rental properties. So that's, that's interesting. I don't personally invest in single family, but it's become more accepted. So um, again, advantages and disadvantages to different asset classes. And depending on what you're interested in or what your expertise is or what your capital stack looks like for that matter, uh, you may select a different asset class. So residential real estate, advantages, good return on invested capital typically, good value appreciation, markets tend to go up over a long period of time, great tax shelters, uh, easy to get tenants, right? Everybody needs a place to live. I like to say that's a business that doesn't go out of business. It's a basic human need, shelter. So super easy. You know, I don't think AI is going to come take that from us. Uh, disadvantages, pretty management intensive. That's what people generally dislike about residential properties. We like to say the three T's, toilets, tenants, and trash, everybody's favorite, right? Uh, improved commercial industrial real estate. Advantages there is you get super long-term tenants. So um, you can have 10 year leases, 15, 20 year leases, even very predictable income. Uh, you can have triple net leases, which means that the tenant basically pays for all the operating expenses on a property and you just collect a check. So very low management burden in those cases. Uh, some triple net properties, you really don't even need a property management company. You just need bookkeeping and you're kind of done. Um, very consistent returns because of those long-term leases and uh, pretty good value appreciation. 
industrial, especially over the last few years, has really exploded because the e commerce revolution, the pandemic, all that type of stuff. Industrial was hands down the hottest asset class through the pandemic and uh, over the last five years or so. It has been a little bit overbuilt right now. So people are starting to kind of feel the pain on industrial. Um, and then on the opposite side of that spectrum, you have office. Unfortunately, the work from home revolution has damaged a lot of office portfolios beyond repair, right? Those are the articles you read about central business district, high rise, class B office built in the 1980s. A lot of those properties are going back to the lenders right now. A lot of distress there and everybody's trying to figure out what's happening in that business because the future of work is probably not what it looked like in 2019, right? Um, <clears throat> retail, I like retail. I have a few retail buildings myself. Um, I think people still need a place to go and you know be customers. The retail businesses of today obviously look different than they did 20 years ago. You're not necessarily going to buy goods, but service-based businesses need typically will often will need a retail location. Uh, the darling of the retail asset class is the grocery anchored center. So grocery anchored retail, those properties are super hot. And why? Because grocery stores generate a lot of trips. If you have a center with a big grocery store in it, all the rest of those suites in your center uh, are going to be leased pretty much all the time because whoever wants to lease those suites knows that you're going to have a steady stream of people in and out of that grocery store, and those other suites are probably going to get good business. So grocery anchored retail is, is, is the favorite in the retail space these days. Um, disadvantages of commercial and industrial uh, and retail, limited availability of tenants. You know, each space is very specific for the use that makes sense. Uh, you know, one person's warehouse is, is not another person's, although warehouse is, is pretty easy, so maybe a bad example. Um, but, you know, big box retail, see a lot of vacancies there right now because those are, that's kind of going away. And what do you do with that space? There's not that many tenants looking for those types of spaces. Um, very picky in terms of like parking and what intersections you're at, uh, all that kind of stuff. Restaurants can be very picky. Um, and then there's the financing is a lot harder in uh, commercial, non-multifamily commercial too. Uh, bigger down payments, lower leverage, higher rates, tougher underwriting. So generally, non-multifamily, non-residential commercial real estate is good if you have a lot of capital. You're probably not investing a small amount of money and in getting into that, with the exception of SBA financed owner user businesses. If you have your own business, you can owner occupy like you would a house. You can owner occupy a commercial property, and you can get 90% loan to value leverage there. Um, and that's an amazing strategy. If you have like an operating business that can move into a building, you can do really well with that. There's some really good tax benefits there too. So uh, that could be a potential real estate investment play kind of joined with uh, if you have another operating business that you're working with. And then you have, you know, unimproved land. So advantages there, no, manage, no management required at all. It's just dirt. When you put up a construction fence, some razor wire, not your problem, right? Uh, there is a chance of extremely high appreciation if you own it in the right place. As cities start continue to develop and people want to build stuff, you could do really well. Disadvantages, no income at all. It's dirt. So it's pure speculation, right? You're buying land on the assumption it might go up. It might not. If you have the expertise to you know, get the land entitled and permitted and develop it, you can add a lot of value that way. If you're interested in that kind of thing, I recommend uh, Mark Macio's class. It's all about development. And that is a super complicated topic that takes a whole semester. Um, but you can make a ton of money there, potentially the highest returns of any of the asset classes, and you can lose your shirt very easily. And a lot of people do, especially these days when the debt markets are doing what they do. So that's sort of a snapshot of the asset classes. Questions on this stuff? Okay, pretty simple. All right, so why are we all doing this? Uh, this is why. You're here for three years, for three hours on a Friday afternoon because whether you understand it or not, we are, you have sensed that maybe there is a powerful concept at play here that allows you to make a lot of money over time by investing your money and having it work for itself. So if you haven't taken Finance 101 yet, all this is is Finance 101. We, we do this for clients that have never been to business school. 
never took finance, don't understand the math. So we try and make this very simple. But really, this is this is what we're manipulating. We're messing around with the time value of money equation, also known as the compound interest formula, which goes something like this. Your future value is worth a sum invested today or your present value times one plus the rate of return that you can make on your investment to the power of N, where N is the number of years your investment compounds, right? You guys probably know that if you took finance already. I enjoy messing around with a financial calculator or Excel uh, in my free time. Actually, it is fun because if you know that, you can kind of extrapolate what you might be able to do with a little bit of pocket change into the future and see how powerful this concept is. So if we unpack the math a little bit here, we notice that it is a exponential equation, right? So by having the N in the exponent, that means if we graph this out on our little cocktail napkin graph and we put time on the x-axis and money on the y-axis, for each additional period of time, the slope of this graph accelerates, right? So your money makes more money each subsequent year that it's invested at a given rate of return. Um, and what you don't see on this graph is R. R determines how quickly this curve goes vertical. So to the extent that you can get a higher rate of return without taking on so much risk that you give it all back, you're gonna you accelerate your ability to be worth that much more in the future faster. And I, like I said before, I think real estate is the single best way to do that without taking on a ton of risk. You can get pretty high rates of return such that if you forecast even just a few years out, it starts to look really, really powerful. Who's already familiar with this concept? Just curious, so I don't have to on it, awesome. most people. Okay, so let's just look at a quick example on this. This is a financial calculator on paper. Um, same numbers should pop out if you use your HP 12C or whatever, uh, or your app. So present value is over here on the left. So this would be your initial investment and some sample numbers for N number of years invested here in second column. And then R would be your return on equity. So we have some sample ROE numbers here, 20%, uh, 25%, and 30%. And then the big matrix in the middle is your future value, assuming any of those uh, variables are input. So let's just like look at 100 grand. Nice even number. If you have 100 grand to put down on a property, so that'd be your down payment, in 10 years, if we can get 20% on your money, it's worth $619,000. Pretty good, multiplied six times. In 15 years though, it's worth 1.5 million, almost triple. And in 20 years, it's worth 3.8 million. If we can do 25%, it's worth 931,000 in 10 years, more than triple, 2.8 million in 15, and 8.6 million in 20. And uh, the 30% column is ridiculous. So what's happening here? This is a tabular representation of the shape of this graph, right? The flat part of the graph is kind of the first 10 years. It's not very exciting. Your principal hasn't had a chance to grow for that long yet. It's not huge. And so it feels like it's not working that fast. And then after your principal has had a while to grow, the graph starts to really turn vertical and go crazy. That's why here, if we're looking in the middle column, it took us 10 years to get to 931,000 and only five years after that to triple and get to 2.8 million. You see how the graph does that? It's it's stupid. It is actually a cocktail napkin trick, but it really works that way in real life. You just have to be patient. It's like, you know, it might take you 15 years, but you're all young. So get started today. Uh, so this is what we're messing with. And we're always trying to figure out how we can maximize our returns without taking on so much risk that we get ourselves in trouble and just keep this going as long as possible. Because after a while, you get this number to be big enough that you're financially independent. If you want a simple rule of thumb, I would say a reasonable expectation for passive income is 5% of your equity at any point in time. You should be able to deliver on that, depending on what you invest in. So that means, you know, uh, you know, nine, whatever, a million dollars in equity, it's not life-changing yet, right? It's $50,000 in income, but $10 million in equity, is $500,000 a year in passive income. Gets to be pretty impactful. These numbers also assume no additional investment at all of new cash throughout the, the life of this. So 
if you have the ability to add cash along the way, you're starting a whole new uh, formula every time you do that. And if you have the ability to buy properties that you can add value to and improve and force appreciation, the numbers start to look a little bit of, a little bit absurd. So at this point, when I'm presenting this part of my spiel to clients, they're usually looking at this and they're saying, yeah, okay, I understand time value money, fine. But what the heck is this? You, you show, you're showing me a chart that starts like 20% ROE. Give me a break. You can't possibly expect that we're going to be able to deliver those types of returns over a long period of time. And I understand that resistance because typically that's not true, right? You can't do that. With real estate, it's actually not unusual at all to get those levels of return. So we're going to dive into that a little bit later. Uh, to make this happen for people, this is kind of something that we do in our, with our company. We help people write an investment plan. So uh, a lot of people call us because they're interested in investing. They watch too much reality TV. They saw a dude with a Lamborghini online and they would like their Lamborghini, please. And so they come to our office and they're like, can I have a piece of that? Um, what most people don't do is ever come in with a plan, like a specific goal on what it might take for them to get there. They just want to be rich. I get it. It's flashy. It's fun. It looks great. Well, you know, to get there effectively, you really have to write an investment plan and have to understand what your parameters are, how the math might fit together so that you could have that Lamborghini without borrowing all of it. <clears throat> so we help people do that. This is an example of, of an investment plan for real estate. Uh, financial advisors do this kind of thing too, typically for stock investors, but generally real estate people don't. I don't understand why they should, um, but it's pretty simple. So beginning of your plan would just be your goals. Uh, so what are you trying to get to? If you recall, if we think we can make a 5% passive income return on our future value at any given point in time, we could work backwards from that number and we could figure out what future value we want to hit to generate our passive income goal. So if we say, I want to generate $500,000 a year in passive income, uh, and I think I can get 5% yield on my equity. I need to develop a portfolio of real estate with $10 million of equity. And from there, I just have to figure out how long it's going to get. It's going to take me to get there based off of what resources I have today and what returns I think I can get in the market. So your general plan is basically just a one sentence plan about that. I'll show you in a minute. The detailed plan would be very specific, kind of like year by year parameters of what you expect your portfolio to be doing, uh, you know, value, cash flow, expenses, financing, taxation, all that kind of stuff. Um, if I'm being honest, the detailed plan is less useful because it changes so quickly, right? You just don't really know the future. It can give you a good approximation of how things might look, but nobody really knows how one property is going to perform versus another one. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to follow up and change the plan all the time because it's going to change on you. So um, it makes sense to revisit at least every year and review your goals. So this, if you write something down today, you mess around with something, I would recommend it perhaps be this. This is a one sentence real estate investing plan. This combined with plugging in the variables into a financial calculator can kind of tell you what's possible and what you think you're working with. So let's just fill in the blanks. I'm gonna invest present value dollars for N years in real estate investments at a sustained rate of return of R percent, and that will be worth future value dollars at the end of the plan. Make sense? It's that same equation, it's just in a word problem. So from here, if you wanna mess around with your financial calculator, you can plug in three variables and solve for the fourth easily, right? Um, so you may want to say, all right, I know what I, my, my resources today are fixed. I have a hundred thousand dollars to invest. So I know what present value is. PV, there it is. We entered it. Um, and I, maybe I figured out what my goal is. I want to do that $10 million thing that Anthony was talking about. So I'm going to put in future value here and a return percent. I think I can get 20%, or well, let's say 25% over the life of my investing per, uh, plan, hit solve, and it's gonna tell you how many years that's gonna take, right? What did we have? Uh, 125, it's gonna take like 21 years, probably something like that. Not bad for under grand. <clears throat> or we could say, uh, I got 100 grand, 
I've only got 10 years and then I want to be done. I'm done. I'm, I'm sick of this work thing. Where am I going to be in 10 years? We, I think I can make 25%. Where am I going to be worth? And you could do the same thing and just solve for future value instead. Or you could say, uh, I've got this much money. I have this many years. I want to be worth this much. What rate of return do I have to hit to do it? So that's the one that people are solving for if you want to be like super aggressive, right? If you want to turn 100,000 into 10 million in 10 years, we have work to do. <laughs> You're off the charts, right? You probably have to get returns in the 40 or 50% range or higher. It's probably not realistic, it's the truth. But that tells you that it's not realistic, right? The Lambo is not arriving tomorrow unless you work a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so I really like this because it's just so simple, really easy. A lot of people love to overcomplicate this stuff. Think about this first, think about goals first, and then work backwards. That's going to be a lot easier for you to figure out what's realistic for yourself, what you're working with, and what that's likely to look like in the future. And again, th this is overly simple. This is overly simple. You, you, this doesn't assume any additional investments in future years, anything like that. You could, you know, create three of these over the next three years, and each one would have a different initial investment that you would add to your portfolio, and then it would have fewer years available to you because you made it one year later, and so on and so forth. And you could make a huge tree out of an investment plan that figures all this stuff out. Um, but I think at, at, at the most basic level, we just want, really want to understand this concept and how everything fits together. Questions on this? Okay. All right, so within that R number, like I said earlier, it's, um, well, I already talked about that, let's get it. Uh, okay, so exit strategies. A lot of people with real estate have this question first. It's like, okay, that's great. We can make all this money. If I invest money today, I'm going to be worth a fortune 20 years from now. Wonderful. Uh, what do we do from there? Do we just like sell everything, pay the taxes? What do I do with this giant portfolio of illiquid buildings? How does that change my life? And you know, what's the best way to approach that? Uh, there's a variety of exit strategies and they all can make sense or they can all be used together. These are some of the most common. Uh, the simplest one would be liquidate as necessary. Do your thing, build your portfolio, sell it off, pocket, pocket cash, buy your Lambo, go to Miami, you're good. You're probably going to pay a lot of tax doing this. I don't recommend that. Um, <clears throat> just selling real estate, you pay capital gains taxes, and if you exchanged your way through your portfolio to build that up, you're going to pay a lot of capital gains taxes. And we can talk about exchanges too. Um, you could own it for passive cash flow. That's perhaps the most common popular one that you hear people say. So you build up that portfolio. That was sort of like the example I was talking about. Uh, if you're calculating what you think the passive income could be based on a future value, then we can kind of calculate what passive cash flow might look like. There's that little 5% number. 5% cash flow on equity should be a pretty doable uh, plan for most people. Um, and so the advantage here is you don't ever actually have to sell anything. Uh, and so from a taxation standpoint, that's really great. You're never actually paying any capital gains. Your property stay on your own balance sheet um, and you just live off the income. Uh, you can get very good uh, depreciation benefits for your income taxes. And then uh, it may be morbid, but uh, currently when you die, your heirs get a step up in basis as to the value at the time of your death. Um, if you have this method, what that means is that if you took that hundred grand and you made it worth 10 million and then you died, when your heirs inherit that, their basis is 10 million. So they can sell all those properties, pocket the 10 million, no capital gain. Whereas if you sold it before you died, you pay tax on 9.9 .9 million. If you invested a hundred thousand and you got 10 million. Tax on 9.9 .9 million is something like two and a half million, three million dollars, right? Depending on what's going on in tax policy at that point in time. So um, that's a popular option, actually, believe it or not. Uh, the 1031 exchange is a great way to do that, which I'll explain in more detail, but that allows you to sell properties and buy new properties with deferring the capital gain, not paying it. It's also known as a 1031 swap. And so the industry has a saying of swap till you drop. Never pay tax. That's my point, personally. Um, you can also refinance for lump sum withdrawals. This is a really good one. So uh, you can do cash out refinances in pretty much all property types. And when you do that, you put new debt on your property 
typically pays off whatever loan is already on the property. And if your new loan is more than your old loan was, the cash is yours. That's typically a tax-free event. So that's a really nice way to access lump sums from your portfolio when you need it for something like buying the Lambo. Now you bought the Lambo without paying tax, right? That's great. Or perhaps a house or something more responsible like your kid's education. Um, <clears throat> so that's a great option you can use and you can use these in conjunction with each other, right? So taking on more debt obviously impacts your cash flow because you owe the payments on the debt, but sometimes life dictates you need lump sums that are uh, larger than just uh, passive cash flow. Uh, and then this was really popular years ago. And for the first time in uh, probably 15 years, it's back. Uh, if you can't read it in the back, it's sell and carry financing. So what does that mean? Seller financing means, let's say you have a property that you own outright. You've paid off the loan. Um, you could sell that to somebody if it's a million dollar building and that person doesn't want to or can't get a bank loan. Maybe they have a hundred grand to put down. They could put down a hundred grand and you could carry a note or you could finance the $900,000. And so then you become the bank, they owe you $900,000 and you get interest on the $900,000. They make payments to you as if and you're, you're, you're the mortgage holder. So um, some great advantages here, yeah. Makes that contract. Typically the buyer and seller make it, uh, it a lot of times, the escrow companies just draw those up. Um, they're starting to not like that as much. So you might see attorneys, a tr real estate transaction attorney would be a perfect person to draw that type of paperwork. And it goes, probably comes from the seller's attorney because they're the ones carrying the note. And it goes to the buyer for review. They should send it to their attorney for review and approval. Everybody signs it. And now you have your note. Um, I've done a lot of seller carry deals in my career. I've sold properties and carried paper and I've bought properties with seller financing. It's an amazing way to do transactions. It's really, really great. If you can find a seller carry deal with pencils as a buyer, there is a lot of value in that, of not having to deal with the bank. You can tend to negotiate better terms than market. Um, it's super fast. All that approval and the underwriting's not there. There's practically zero fees regarding appraisal and all that and loan fees and stuff like that. And the terms are just totally up for negotiation. So it is a great way to do transactions. This was practically non-existent for the last 10 years. Why? Because interest rates were so low, the prospect as a seller of selling your building and then taking payments at three and a half percent, bad deal, right? Nobody wants to do that. Um, these days, you know, the market interest rates in the sixes. So as a seller, I could sell my building carry paper at 6%. If my building was only cash flowing at 5%, I make more cash flow and I don't have the three T's to deal with anymore, right? I'm not managing my property anymore. And if the buyer defaults on the loan, I'll just foreclose and take the building back. That's fine with me. I already know the building. I'll just sell it again and take it, take it back. So um, really great way to do transactions. It's suddenly been way more popular over the last few years. We've done a lot of seller carry transactions just over the last two years since interest rates started going up so high. The other great thing about seller financing as a seller is it's a good um, tax deferral strategy too, because you don't pay the capital gains tax when you sell on the part that you carry the paper for. So in the example of the million dollar property, if I take a hundred thousand cash down payment and I carry a note for 900 grand, I only pay capital gains tax on the hundred thousand dollar down payment. I don't pay my capital gains tax until the buyer pays off a loan. And so I've had situations where uh, we've had a buyer buy a property I can think of maybe a year ago or so. The seller was much older. They're in their 80s. And they said, um, I'll carry. I don't want you to pay it off because I want to die with this loan outstanding. Because the same thing applies here. His heirs get the step up in basis to the value of the note at the time of his death. And so what he did is we structured a massive prepayment penalty into the seller note that would require the buyer to pay 25% of the outstanding balance as a prepayment penalty if you refinanced and paid it off earlier. And why was it 25%? Because that's the amount of the capital gains that he would owe. So, you know, when I talk about the ability to apply some creativity to deals, and it, it just opens up so many options. Great example, you know, in, in real estate of how, how you can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, for that option as a buyer, how much do you usually need to put down a uh, percentage wise? So the question was for a seller carry as a buyer, how much do you need to put down as a percentage wise? And the answer is, it's totally whatever you can negotiate. Um, 
that being said, I think you know I see deals pretty commonly that want at least fifty percent down. The sellers want collateral. You know, they want safety in the collateral. So the more equity that they got out of you up front, the less likely you are to walk away from the deal. Um, on the other hand, you know, I bought an eight unit apartment building a few years ago with 15% down. So 85% leverage, which is way higher than you can get from a bank at all. Um, and in the, in the GFC, when I started investing, uh, we bought properties where we basically took over payments and put nothing down. Uh, so, you know, when it's really bad, you can do stuff like that. Um, so it's completely negotiable. I would say the market norm is like 30%, 35%, something like that. Which I'm probably... how, do you, how do you connect with sellers uh, as a buyer? As a buyer? Well, I mean, typically brokers are the are involved. Um, so a, a lot of seller carry deals are actually out there on the market right now. Um, if you go on LoopNet, Zillow, whatever, and you type in seller financing or seller will carry or something like that, um, you should be able to find them online. Most sellers and brokers know that offering a deal with seller financing is very attractive to a buyer. So they're going to advertise that if they're willing to do it in many cases. And you'll be able to find that through a broker like us. So we might have people that came to us and say, I really want a deal. I need a seller carry. What do you got? And I can go out and find a lot of deals that have seller financing available. Otherwise, you know, um, reaching out to sellers directly, I mean, that's what brokers do. Uh, I guess you can call people and, you know, look up a bunch of numbers and send text messages and letters and all that if you really want to. That's kind of what all, all of our competitors are doing. Uh, but good question. Yes. When you do the 1031, like, swaps or exchanges for the tax deferral, mm -hmm. do you ever get rushed to make, like, a decision for a property because of the time frame? You, yeah. So the question was, when you do a 1031 exchange, do you ever get rushed to make a decision because of the time frames? The answer is yes. <laughs> Sometimes people do. So you have to be... Uh, ahead of the curve on that, you've got to be quick, you've got to be on it, and kind of know what you're looking for in advance. Um, working with a good broker that does a lot of those is really important because we could be way ahead of it even before your property is listed, of understanding what your options are going to be, how the finances are going to fit together, what the rules look like, what the inventory and in the kind of category that you're going to be looking at looks like, and maybe even some potential properties. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that we do all the time. Uh, we always try to avoid our clients getting anywhere near the end of those deadlines. I'll get into the details on the exchange in, in a minute too, because that gets complicated. And there's a whole, um, there's an entire certificate seminar all about 1031 exchanges um, that Edgar Asensio teaches. So if you haven't had that one and you want to get into detail there, um, he does a good job with that. <clears throat> Other questions on any of these exit strategies? Does this kind of all make sense? So to me, this is another huge benefit of real estate, right? Multiple exit strategies, totally flexible. You can use some or all of them as necessary. And many of them, really, I would argue all of them, but this one are, are somewhat tax uh, sheltered. Okay, so um, getting back to that R number, we, we were looking at our time value of money equation, our general plan for investing. Uh, and we were making gross generalizations about what your rate of return could be in a real estate portfolio. So within that equation, your R or your return on equity isn't as simple as saying, I'm going to make 15% of my money. It doesn't work like that. It's not just like investing in a growth stock or something. You make returns from four different elements of return, and all of these together equal that R number for you. So um, here they are. If you can't read it, uh, you have appreciation, which is the increase in value over time of the property. And we'll get into each one of these in detail. You have cash flow, so relatively self-explanatory. That's your spendable cash income after paying, you've taken the rents after you pay all of your operating expenses and your mortgage. That's cash flow. You have equity buildup through amortization. So that's the principal pay down on your loan. If you bought a building with a loan, most loans have uh, payments of principal and interest. The part that goes to paying principal can be expressed as a return because your tenants are actually the one paying the mortgage for you. Your tenants pay you, you use that money to pay the mortgage, principal goes down, that is a return. That's your equity. That payment every month goes to equity for you. So um, we have to calculate that and include that in your returns. That's called equity buildup through amortization, also known as principal pay down. Um, and then you have tax shelter benefits. 
So we can we can quantify the tax shelter benefits that you get investing in real estate versus alternative assets. And we can apply a percentage to that, uh, depending on what building you buy. And uh, typically the two biggest tax benefits we talk about are the 1031 exchanges, and then you get a depreciation right off too. So you can take book depreciation on a property um, that's in addition to your operating expenses, which makes your income tax shelter. So we're gonna get into the details on those too. Make sense? If you want an easy acronym, it's CAT with two A's, cash flow, appreciation, amortization, tax. Very simple. All right, let's get into each one. So we have appreciation first. So everybody thinks they know what appreciation is probably. Values of property go up over time. Yes. Um, it's a little more complicated than that though. I would argue there's two components of appreciation. So yes, values of property tend to go up over time. Not always. Some asset classes are going down right now. Some are going up. Um, but there's two, there's two main components. One, the increase in the demand for that property over time that makes prices go higher, right? Um, just like if gold becomes more valuable, prices go up, diamonds, Bitcoin, whatever, NVIDIA. Uh, same thing happens with real estate. So to the extent that people want property in Westchester, prices go up. So that's demand-based appreciation. In addition to that, you have inflation-based appreciation. So for the first time, in many decades, we have a lot of inflation going on, or we have until very recently. It sounds like it's been tamed. And inflation is your best friend when you're a real estate investor, other than what it does to interest rates. Um, inflation causes prices ac across the economy, across the market to go up, right? The purchasing power of the dollar gets eroded over time. We've probably all experienced that in the price of your rent and your gas and your car and your textbooks and the grocery store and whatever, right? Everything is all of a sudden way more expensive over the last few years. That's inflation in action. When you own real estate, the value of your property goes up with inflation and so do your rents. So it's a perfect hedge against inflation. But I think calling it a hedge against inflation isn't even the full story. What you're really doing is you are you are using inflation and multiplying the effects of inflation to make money. It's not just that it protects you from inflation. Inflation is a good thing for you when you're a real estate investor. Uh, and we'll dig into some of the math behind that in a minute too. But generally speaking, you have appreciation from both inflation and from increased demand. And both kind of have the same effect on your property's value. Yeah. How much does inflation affect rent control property? So in, the question was, how much does inflation affect rent control properties? It depends what flavor of rent control you have. Uh, so the general statewide California rent control from Assembly Bill 1482, also known as the Tenant Protection Act, allows landlords to increase rents on apartment buildings by 5% plus the change in consumer price index or inflation up to a maximum of 10% every 12 months. So inflation allows landlords to increase rents more than they would had were the inflation lower, but the cap is still 10%. So it's still gonna be between five and 10%. That's based off regional CPI from April to April of each year and effective in August. So beginning August 1st of this year, our regional CPI for last April to this past April was 3.9%. So the allowable increase currently across California is 8.9%. If we had no inflation, it would be fun. Um, but there's different rent control rules all over the place. So the city of LA has its own rent control that applies to properties built in 1978 or earlier that are duplexes and above. The city of LA rent control is supposed to also allow, give an allowable increase in line with inflation um, that has a little bit more complicated formula, but basically they tell everybody what the allowable increase is every year. And unfortunately it was supposed to be 7% this year and they just said, no, we're not doing it. Sorry, and it's three or it was four, I think. And then for the whole like the pandemic, it was zero. They just did a complete rent freeze. So depending on what jurisdiction you're in, the rent control can be more extreme or less extreme. Uh, the general statewide one, uh, it's very much linked to inflation. Um, interestingly, you'll also see a lot in commercial leasing, you'll see escalation clauses in the lease tied to inflation. So <laughs> you might have a base rent, whatever it is, and then the base rent increases by 
the change in CPI uh, to, you know, with a cap of 5% every year throughout the term of the lease. And that's just negotiable between the parties, but you see that often in commercial leasing too. So it has a lot to do with that. Good question. Other questions on appreciation? Cool. So yeah, I mentioned it earlier, but demand appreciation, you know, that's resulting from stuff like increased population density, jobs, supply of land, that kind of stuff. So I love investing in Southern California personally, because if you think about it, when you look off the hill or by the library, we have uh, ocean on two sides of LA, uh, mountains to the north and hundred miles of city to the east and pretty much no land, right? So we have this natural geographical uh, constraint on supply for real estate here in LA that tends to result in much higher appreciation than other markets. Even though a lot of the uh, people online love to hate California for all of our rent control stuff, the truth is that the numbers look really good investing in California. They're just trying to get that California money to get out of California and invest in their deal in Texas. And they're hurting right now because their vacancy rates are 13. <clears throat> Sorry, you can tell I'm biased. But, you know, actually, I shouldn't even apologize. So, okay, uh, let's look at this over a long period of time. Our company's been doing our own research for uh, almost 60 years. We've been around since 1963. We started tracking local values in 1965. Probably can't see this because it's small. Uh, but in 1965, what this chart is, uh, is um, price per square foot on multifamily properties of two units and above in what we call the greater South Bay. So this is about LAX down through Long Beach, which is where our company does the majority of our business. Uh, and in 1965, the average price per square foot was 14 bucks. That would be great today. Unfortunately, the effects of inflation have happened and you can see the shape of the chart. You don't even need to read the numbers. Uh, in year to date, 2024, we're at 493 per square foot. And we ended 2023 also at 493 per square foot. And this is a really interesting chart to unpack a little bit. So a uh, very simple representation of kind of pricing over almost six decades. You can see the business cycle in the chart and that real estate is not immune to that. There are years where prices go down, um, but more often than not, prices go up. I think the last time I counted, there were only 18 years out of 56 where we were like not at an all time high in this chart. So on the overall, prices tend to go up and to the right. A lot of that is from inflation, but not all of it. So this goes back to me saying, real estate's a great hedge against inflation. Uh, if we look a little bit at some of the business cycles, you can see how, how they typically play out. So in 1969, we topped out at 18 bucks a square foot, little uh, slide down to 17 in 1971. From 71 to 81, it went up to $86 a square foot. Big rise, that was the last time we had a lot of inflation going on in the economy. Um, from 81 down to 83, it slid from $86 to $85. Oh boy. Uh, and then 83 to 1991 went up to 140. Early 90s, we had a pretty bad real estate downturn. That was the savings and loan crisis. And we went from $140 a square foot in 91 down to $114 in 95. So, pretty big, long uh, downturn. 95 went from 114 all the way up to 329 in 2007. That's the subprime boom. Uh, that was an interesting time to be around. You know, your, your dog could get a loan at that point in time to buy a piece of investment property. Uh, and they did, some dogs got loans. <laughs> that obviously unraveled in spectacular fashion in uh, 2008 and we crashed down to $205 a square foot. And then ever since 2011 at the bottom, We've had the steady rise up to 2022 at a height of 518. And we are in a downturn again now for the first time in a really long time. So a lot of interesting stuff to look at right now. Actually, a very good time to be a buyer right now because we're in a downturn. My personal opinion is that we've actually seen the bottom already. And then our current downturn is much more reminiscent of this one uh, than any of the others. Uh, another interesting thing about this chart is it's kind of misleading a little bit. Um, it's not on a logarithmic scale. So this looks like a bigger boom than anything else, right? But do the percentage math with me for a minute. Who's got a calculator? 17 bucks to 86. Or maybe let's just go by hundreds of percent. It's over 400%, right? Huge increase. Uh, 
114 bucks to 329, a little under 300%. 205 to 518, a little over 200%, right? So this looks huge. Um, this and this were nothing compared to what happened in the 70s. And why? Inflation. The 70s, we had runaway inflation for like an entire decade. Interest rates got up to like 18% in the early 80s before they finally broke it and caused the economy to go into recession. Um, this is the kind of the last time we've dealt with what we're dealing with today. So, you know, I think the Fed did a better job this time around of getting it under control faster. 10 years of price increases like we've experienced over the last couple of years would be really bad. <laughs> That'd be painful for everyone, and they know that, they remember that, so they've gotten better. Um, but that's what can happen when, when inflation gets completely out of control. And if you owned real estate starting in 1971 and your properties went up by 400% in value, you were probably pretty stoked. So did your rents at the same time, right? So the scale is smaller, but this was insane, absolutely insane. Where we go from here is anybody's guess. Uh, the Fed is widely expected to cut rates at their next meeting in September. Uh, Jerome Powell's come out right out and said it. Uh, this is a Fed beard, by the way. When they cut, I cut. That's the deal. So I can't wait. It drives me insane. It's really hot in August. Uh, I don't usually have a beard, but yeah, it's an office challenge. So we'll see. I'll be clean shaven in January, hopefully, when I come back to do this class. Uh, so yeah, really interesting to just unpack this a little bit and see where we are. Another thing you notice about the... Um, Trends here is we never come back to our previous high when we have a downturn, right? So we went down 17, up to 86, down to 85, 140, never came back to the previous high. So what that says for you is that investing in real estate, as long as it's a long-term endeavor and you are conservative enough so you're never forced to sell, you are going to do well over a long period of time. You have to think 10 plus years and there's going to be difficult times and we're in one now been very difficult for those of us that own properties. Super challenging last two years. I can get into that if you want. But if you can invest so you're not forced to sell, you always end up better off in the long run. So you know, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Uh, our Wi-Fi password at the office is get rich slow. And it really does work that way. Um, but it, it takes some patience. <clears throat> so really interesting stuff. Our average rate of appreciation is 6.3% every year over that 56 years. So that's that overwhelming positive trend. So there we have number one element for R, right? Four elements of return, one, 6.3%. We're building our case for that 20% plus ROE that I told you was possible. Questions on this chart? There's a lot here. Yes, sir. Great question. So what are some scenarios where you could be forced to sell? You're seeing a lot of that happen right now. Uh, it usually has to do with getting in over your skis on debt. Almost every time it's the debt that does it. And so what's happened over the last few years is, uh, especially from 2020 through the middle of 2022, interest rates were super, super low. They were in the threes. They were even in the twos in some cases. Especially with commercial real estate debt, those loans are usually fixed for a short period of time, and then they go adjustable, or they even have a balloon payment at the end of their fixed term. And so like a very common loan for an apartment building would be five years fixed uh, at three and a half percent and then adjustable. So if you got a loan in 2020 for five years fixed at three and a half percent and you bought a building, you're looking at 2025 right now, right around the corner, and that loan's about to adjust. And a lot of those loans have interest rates that are going to go from three and a half percent to eight and a half percent. And so when your interest rate goes from three and a half percent to eight and a half percent, you might be losing money every month. If you didn't raise the rent a ton. And even worse, you might be in a situation where you can't refinance the property because they do commercial real estate underwriting based off of what the income is relative to the mortgage payment, which I'll show you the details of uh, later today. And you can be in a situation where it's impossible to refinance your building under any scenario, which is the situation that a lot of owners are facing right now, especially in the office market, but to a pretty large degree in the multifamily market as well. So you have people that pooled a lot of funds. Maybe they were big syndications. They raised a lot of limited partner equity. They went and bought these buildings. They had aggressive business plans. They were assuming they were going to be able to refi at four or four and a half percent. And we were conservative on our refi assumptions because we want a, a percentage point higher than we paid on the way in. But to go to refi, a new loan today is at six or six and a half. 
we can't refinance it, we're forced to sell. And when you're forced to sell, because of systemic reasons like that going on in the rest of the market, other people are also forced to sell. And when other people are forced to sell, more buildings are on the market. And when there's more to choose from, and you have to sell because you're losing money every month, or God forbid you have a balloon payment and you're about to get foreclosed on and you want at least some of your equity back, what happens? You bargain and you take the price that whatever the highest bidder is willing to bid. And it happens to be today that that price in general is about 20% below what it was in the middle of 2022. So people are being forced to sell and they're losing money right now. So if you can be in a position where you're never forced to sell, you're going to be fine. You can hold through this. You can chill out. You can just pay the higher um, rate. If you have additional cash, you could do a cash in refi. I did my first ever cash in refi at the beginning of 2023. Not proud, but I did it. Uh, still on the building, wasn't forced to sell, right? So there's all these scenarios that can kind of become a house of cards for the market, even though there's not a lot of foreclosures out there right now, because there was a lot of equity in these buildings, but people are losing money. They're losing some of their equity and they're being forced to sell and they're realizing losses. What you don't want to do is realize losses when this is going on. If you don't realize the loss and it comes back up, you didn't lose any money. So that's the big thing. Do we have a question over here? Yes, sir. Like cash in refi, are you signing up for a fixed rate or still going adjustable? I did a fixed rate on that one. I did a new five year fixed cash in refi. Um, and I fought tooth and nail to get 6.05% on my rate. And I had to bring cash to closing. But I got to keep my building and it's, it's still cash flows just fine. So uh, I, that one actually worked out pretty well. I can't complain too much. But if I didn't have the cash available, I would have had no choice but to sell. That one, on that building, I had a bridge loan, which got a lot of people into trouble in this cycle. I had a bridge loan that was due in 18 months. So not just, it wasn't just adjusting, I had a balloon payment. So if I could not make that refinance, they could foreclose on me just because I didn't pay the building off in 18 months. So it was that or fire sale. So I chose to do the cash and refi, keep the asset. Other questions on that? We're going to get into the numbers and the mechanics on how that works too. Yes, sir. Um, so how do you avoid um, being forced to sell in the situation where you're in a lack of premium or prices where there's some changes that it has to be factored? A license? Or, sorry. Um, how do you avoid the risk of being like, you know, you're trapped in there where? Uh, of, of like a balloon payment. The best way to avoid the risk of being forced to sell is not take on too much debt. Yeah, uh, there's a variety of reasons that you can end up there. Uh, but generally speaking, the less debt you have, the easier it is to refinance out of that debt because it's easier to support the debt service when you do go for a refinance. Um, and that's kind of the mechanic that's at play a lot today is, is what's going on there. It's not so much about a license or you know an agreement. The balloon payments... Again, if you have less debt and there's a balloon payment coming due, you're more likely to be able to refinance out of a property where you have less debt. That's just the way the numbers work. So I can show you how that works in a little bit. <laughs> um, here's the same chart adjusted for inflation. So we backed out the um, inflation component of it. This is just the demand-based side of the appreciation. So going back to 65, you can see we still have an increased level of demand over time, even if we back out the inflation. So this is all in um, 2024 dollars. So 14 bucks um, in 1965, that was the equivalent of $138 today. So you can see that it's still, there's more demand at, you know, every cycle. Okay, so element of return number one was appreciation. Element of return number two, cash flow. So cash flow is pretty simple. Who's taken accounting yet? All right. So accounting is, or at least managerial accounting, if you're not talking tax accounting, accounting is all about the income statement, pretty much, right? That's the, that's the most used of the four statements in accounting. Uh, if you thought accounting was boring, pay attention to the income statement part, at least, if you want to get into real estate, because you're going to be looking at a lot of income statements. So here's what the income statement looks like on a typical investment property or apartment building. Uh, and this is where we get to the cash flow number, is through the income statement. So um, this is from operations, right? So you have your gross scheduled rents. That's just the total rents your building can charge or your rent roll times 12. So if your rent roll is whatever, $10,000 a month is what you're collecting in rents. Your gross scheduled rents is $120,000. 
uh, minus a vacancy allowance. We want to assume that there's going to be some turnover in our units, so we reserve for that. A typical market vacancy rate is about 5% here right now. We're fortunate to have a nice low vacancy rate in LA because see previous talk about there being no land, right? Hard to find a place to live, hard to find a place to rent. Plus other income and other income would make up things like laundry and parking for the most part in apartment buildings. Um, that gives you your effective gross income. After your effective gross income, you subtract operating expenses. So your operating expenses are things like property taxes, insurance, paying for professional property management, uh, maintenance, repairs, utilities, uh, reserves, all that kind of stuff that you have to pay on a monthly basis. Those are your operating expenses. And then at the bottom, you have your net operating income. Super important metric. So your net operating income is just the building's income after operating expenses, but before debt service, before mortgage payments. So uh, who invests in stocks or buys businesses? Yeah, everybody knows what EBITDA is? EBITDA multiple or earnings multiple? In apartments or in investment property, NOI or net operating income is the equivalent of EBITDA or earnings. Yes, sir. Sorry? A lot of companies they use EBITDA. Yeah. So we don't use EBITDA for apartments. I'm just saying this is equivalent to EBITDA. If you're looking at a company instead of a building, it's the same kind of metric. It's the same idea. So this is income before uh, amortization, debt service payments, depreciation, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really useful metric because we can use this to compare different buildings to each other. So NOI is probably the most, the most useful metric you're gonna have if you have good data. After that, we subtract the debt service. So that's your mortgage payments, your annual mortgage payments. And then you have cash flow. That's your spendable income. Right? That's cash flow. If you take the percentage of this number, divide it into your initial investment, that is your cash on cash percentage. You've probably heard of that before if you fool around with real estate. I like to call it cash return on equity. Cash on cash is meaningless after year one. Because what, what you bought, what you invested in the property in year one is actually meaningless. After year one, your equity is the most important thing. So I like to look at cash return on equity instead of cash on cash. Same idea. So that is element of return number two. And, and like I said, it's pretty normal for this to be about, in normal times, you should be able to get about 5% cash flow on your equity. So now we have 6.3% from appreciation and about 5% from cash flow. Um, this is very difficult to get 5% from cash flow right now because of interest rates. But in normal circumstances, you should be able to do it. Number three, equity buildup from amortization. So we talked about this. This is your principal pay down on the loan. Um, and you can, this is a known number. There's no uh, mystery to it. You just use an amortization calculator when you're figuring out what you're borrowing on the property. And you're going to know to the cent what your principal pay down is going to be every year as long as you hold that loan. I've got a really simple example. So if you have $1.2 million property, you put 300 down, you borrow 900 grand. You can tell I made this presentation a couple of years ago. Your interest rate was 4%. Uh, your interest payment uh, was $29.76. Your principal payment was $13.2075. And your total was $42.97. This principal payment uh, for the year is your principal pay down or this source of return. And this slowly grows. This, the principal pay down portion of your Mortgage payment slowly grows with each month that you pay. That's how the amortization schedule works. I don't know if you've played with the mortgage calculator. Very exciting stuff. But, you know, it's a, kind of like a forced savings account, except when your tenants are paying, it's a return. This is probably the easiest one. No guesswork here. <clears throat> tax benefits. So this is where we get into the exchange and the depreciation. So calculating your tax benefits, you can quantify the tax benefits you get for investing in a piece of real estate versus your return investing in a non-tax sheltered asset. Um, the 1031 exchange is difficult to quantify. Basically, you're just avoiding capital gains. And so we, you know, I can explain the mechanics of that, but the way that that works is you can sell an appreciated piece of real estate and you can buy another one for equal or greater value and not owe any capital gains taxes. 
the specific rules get very, very complicated. But at a high level, um, you have 45 days to identify a replacement property after you sell your, what we call your down leg or the property you owned, your relinquished property. And then you have 180 days from closing to purchase and close on your up leg or your replacement property. So those were the time frames that we were talking about earlier that people, people can get real nervous on these. If you satisfy this and you have to buy for as much or more as you sold for, if you satisfy those rules, you pay no capital gain. You also cannot touch the money. So the money goes to a neutral third party intermediary called a 1031 exchange accommodator. They hold your funds after the closing of your down leg. And then when you're ready to close on your up leg, they wire the funds into the escrow company for the up leg. It closes you on the building, no tax. It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> there is a reverse 1031 exchange. It's also a useful tool. Um, similar, but with a reverse 1031 exchange, you buy first and sell later. So you buy your up leg property and you have 45 days from when you close on your up leg property to identify a property you're gonna sell. That's a little easier. You probably know what property you're gonna sell already. And then you have 180 days to sell the property that you were gonna sell and you're good. The mechanics of that are what sometimes confuse people and get people in trouble. Because in order to buy the, how do you buy the property without selling the other one first? You don't have the money. So you either use your own cash as the down payment to close on the, on the up leg. Then when the down leg closes, you just reimburse yourself with the cash from the down leg sale. Or you put a secondary, second trustee on the down leg to borrow the down payment for the up leg, buy the up leg, sell the down leg, pay off both loans, and you're done. But typically people, it gets very expensive because putting second trustees on your properties is going to be a, kind of a hard money loan. You're going to pay two or three, four points, and you're probably going to pay 11% interest for them. So, but it's a great tool if you found the property that you know you want to have and you just don't have time to sell your down leg because we have that illiquidity problem we talked about earlier. Reverse exchange is awesome. I've done a lot of reverse exchanges myself because I think it's an amazing tool. Uh, it, it actually eliminates the stress about the time periods is the best thing about it. Because you could spend a year waiting to find the perfect up leg. You find it, get it in contract. As soon as it's in contract, you get your down leg ready to sell and get it going. Close on the up leg, close on the down leg. So you can be patient about finding the right deal. But it's more expensive and it has some mechanical trickiness. Great question. Uh, makes sense on exchanges? Like I said, Edgar Asensio, who's one of the other React members, teaches an entire seminar on exchanges, how that works, why you want to do it. What happens is over time, as your properties appreciate, you get more equity. And as you get more equity in your buildings, it dilutes your return on equity over time. So as your return on equity gets diluted, you want to do a 1031 exchange to re-leverage, increase your returns again, and continue to grow your portfolio without paying taxes. That's the fifth. Two sentences, you got it. <laughs> um, depreciation deduction is the actual kind of uh, quantifiable part of the tax benefits that we can do here. So when you own an investment property, you can depreciate the value of what are called the improvements over a given period of time. Um, the IRS calls the structure, the physical stuff on the land, the improvements. So the land itself is not depreciable, but anything that's built onto the land is depreciable. So this building, everything in it is depreciable, right? For uh, apartment buildings, residential properties, they can be depreciated over 27 and a half years. Other commercial properties can be depreciated over 39 years. I don't know why, that's just the rules as the IRS. Um, but that allows you to just take a book right off for that depreciation every year, which is amazing. So the IRS has said, well, you know, your physical stuff goes obsolete over time and wears out. So we're gonna allow you to write off that obsolescence over a long period of time. But in reality, we know the properties actually go up in value. So not only do you, as an investor, you get the appreciation for the property going up in value, but the IRS allows you to depreciate the property as if it were going down in value, which is not. So it's kind of amazing. Uh, you can get super fancy on this stuff. You can accelerate depreciation. You can do cost segregation studies. You can do things that allow you to pay no tax at all, like me, um, except for California. But uh, it's really amazing. It gets super complicated. You probably need an accounting degree to understand all that stuff. But 
uh, it, it's an amazing benefit for a real estate investor. Suffice it to say, probably 50% or so of the purchase price is going to be a write-off over 27 and a half years, and you're sheltering your cash flow with that book depreciation write-off, which makes some or even all of your cash flow tax-free. Yes? Um, as a long-term investor, obviously, hopefully, buildings last a really long time, and they'll last forever. Right. Is the end goal, you know, the property itself gets more valuable as the building depreciates? And if you develop, or is it to like leave somebody else in the bag and sell the Yeah, no, it's a good question. You would think that, like, well, I used up the whole tank, and so the next person isn't going to have any depreciation. Actually, that's not how it works at all. Uh, the IRS lets each new owner start a new depreciation schedule. So um, I did a deal where last year the owner had owned the property for 30 years. So it was fully depreciated for him. He ran out. His, he no longer gets that right. Off. My client bought the building because he wanted to re, the, the seller wanted to reset his depreciation clock on a new purchase. My client got a fresh clock on a 60-year-old building. And the client selling it bought something else and got a fresh clock on that building. So as long as you just keep trading the baseball cards, you get to keep resetting the, the clock. So does that put like a 30-year lifespan on it? Uh, no, as long as it trades hands, it does not, because you get to reset that, that clock every time you, every time the property is sold. But if you hold it for that long, you'll just run out of the write-off. The write-off will be gone. So if you, if you build new structures on it, you get to restart that. I wouldn't do that specifically for tax purposes, but it's a secondary benefit if it already makes sense to build something on the property. But yeah, you can add to that depreciable amount as you make improvements. Yeah, it's a great benefit. Um, okay, so how are we doing? 2.30, should we take 10? Just get a little dense. All right, let's take 10. Let's come back at 237. I'm thinking if you can add to your, you can either expense the expenses to get better, or you're writing a nice or you're writing a nice you're writing a nice I'll give you a nice there's a ceremony you are uh, confirmation that you're next. And then you get another, 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 and then you I don't know. I just started my uh, yeah. I have to learn the thing. It's a lot. Yeah. You should give her a yeah. yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I did. I saw a store and I go to like some oh, yeah. I I I My notes are writing like, yeah. Yeah. look up what this means yeah. later. <laughs> 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 this is so weird. <laughs> Uh, uh, we have a bunch of you. Yeah. Yeah. Do I 
I know. Do we need to bring the chips next time? It's like, we're there some people on the back. Yeah, I would love to. I've been on the back taking the down. Like, so you Oh, so you're kidding. Yeah, no. Thank you. Yeah, of course. No, I think it's some, I'm like finding spots. I would either do that or do that. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 There's nothing uh, I'm not going to hold a for me. You know, I personally think it was kind of like a good thing. You can go to that side, but it's not that. Really? That is just now. I'm still different, I guess. I'm not for going to a big name because I don't want to get in trouble. But often when you see my experience, you don't really have to make a Already you're a tiny cop. So I your job. I know. I'm thinking right now this way. My company is a lot of I literally never seen it. So it's pretty solid. I'm going to get that way. Yeah. So you can just sell sheet up. Same idea. Yeah. A lot of like assaults. Yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. Oh, good. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'll be joining us. I try to go to all of them when I can. I couldn't make the But I try to go to all of them. Yes. Yeah, it's like a work study position. Right. It's like it's it's free money. It's like it's it's literally it's free money. Yeah. Is it just like the price? Yeah. Well, I think artists want to hide. So there's a there's a support staff where you make sure you sit in the corner and make sure the yeah. students working well. I don't need that. I'm just going to have to stay back. Uh, and make that's sure that's the correct. I don't see that. From the uh, Maybe. Yeah. 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 It um, ours is your dating. Yeah. yeah, it's more just like yeah. traffic yeah. attendance, exactly. making sure everyone's getting the right yeah. emails yeah. and yeah. reminders. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then one like, one main event. Yeah. 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 The bus tour is the best one by the far. Great. They did. You have Yeah, I did. Because I had to. I was, you know, I to be Yeah. And I missed it. Oh. That's kind of awesome. Yeah, I just don't want to have to do it. Yeah, just figure it out. You guys email and I'll actually have a mailchimp. Yeah, I'll do it with this. 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 I'll do it with this.
Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. And then I'll share my screen. I I'm 
Take the first test after 15 days. Okay, okay. 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 Did you already have those? So you have some with it. No, I I did try to take it to the party. Um but like okay, I was talking about something that they said before they took the actual test, they feel like it was practice or something. Yes. Um but I have both that's fair. I do that's it's not worth it. I'll send you a light on that. That is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit there. 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 I'm going to but that's so funny because those three courses, none of these materials are on the actual things. I was like, why are you mistaken? That's true. It's, it's, I'm so busted. It's like a lot of things, right? No. It, it's like, it's a little bit. A little bit. Like, my thing is, uh, like, eight, 1978. I'll go to the foundation. I said a couple of acronyms and got some crap. It's RAM, like, scarcity, marketing, marketability. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, what's the hardest, like, um, economic thing to get out of them? Hey, hey. Okay, let's get started again. Sorry, a little technical difficulties here, so you got 15 minutes. Um, all right, who's totally confused? Anyone? Oh, one, one, one honest person in the crowd. Okay. Uh, any follow-up questions on that stuff that you were thinking about while you were chatting that didn't make sense? We're kind of building on everything here. So if I lost somebody, let me know. No? Okay. All right. So um, we sort of set the ground, the you know, the groundwork for returns. Uh, elements of return, why real estate, asset classes, uh, that kind of stuff. Now we're going to get into a little bit more comparison metrics, like analysis stuff. Like, should you buy one property versus another? What do you need to know to compare them to each other? And how do we model out returns and maybe pick a, pick a winner, right? So I've got a little sample building for you. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the metrics that go into all that before we get there. So, um, first and foremost, I want, I want everybody to understand this concept. So there's basically no way around the trade-off between cash flow and appreciation. So we talked about four elements of return, 
right? Probably number one, number two is cash flow and appreciation. And you can have both, and most properties do deliver both, but to the extent that you get one versus the other, there is typically a trade off there. And so, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, we get into a whole bunch of comparison metrics. We can compare asset classes to each other, we can compare areas to each other, property types. A lot of this boils down to location, but also property age, condition, and stuff like that. So, um, very high cash flow properties, typically lower appreciation. Very high appreciation properties, typically lower cash flow. So, an investment property in Manhattan Beach, that's probably going to make the majority of its returns through appreciation and very little, if any, cash flow. And uh, you could say the opposite for something out in the middle of the desert. All your return is going to be from cash flow, very little from appreciation. And it's our job as an investor to decide between the two and see where each property lies on the spectrum and figure out what makes the most sense for us. For most investors, most people settle on something in the middle of the road because there's problems at both extreme ends of the spectrum, like much of life, uh, where the middle of the road is an easier place to play. Uh, but let's unpack that a little bit, okay? So um, <clears throat> we can look at some metrics to begin with. Again, uh, going back to our research from decades ago, uh, Hawthorne and Manhattan Beach are right next to each other. Everybody probably knows these cities not too far away. Uh, this is price per square foot in Manhattan Beach from 1971 to 2011. It's an old example, but whatever, uh, it checks out. The 40 year rate of appreciation in that time period in Manhattan Beach was a little over 9%. Uh, the same time period in Hawthorne was about 6%. So uh, not as good in Hawthorne. So who would rather own the Manhattan Beach property than the Hawthorne property? I see a few hands, and I would not blame you for that. The Hawthorne property is actually going to make more money, though. The Manhattan Beach property probably, probably did not. The Hawthorne property cash flows more, but because of the cash flow, it's going to allow you to use more debt or more leverage which is gonna multiply this appreciation rate probably by a factor enough to eclipse the money you're making from Manhattan Beach. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how those uh, concepts come together. There's all these kind of like interrelated financial concepts when you're looking at different buildings that are hard to understand and they're counterintuitive. Because everybody's gonna say, I don't fault you for saying Manhattan Beach. Everybody would rather own the Manhattan Beach property. Just in your head, that's oh, beautiful. It's nice. It's worth a ton of money. All the athletes live there. I'll take the Manhattan Beach one, please. I get it. Uh, in reality, that might not be the right move. <clears throat> yeah. So, if the more cash flow, but a lower debt to payment, you're getting a higher debt. More cash flow supports enough debt to allow a lower down payment, which multiplies your returns. So, I'll show you how that works. Um, here's that market study again. So, you know, on a comparison basis, actually, all of Southern California is more of an appreciation-based market than a lot of other markets, especially the LA area. So this chart would not look this way in Phoenix or Las Vegas or even San Bernardino, uh, no offense to any, or Minneapolis. I'm from Minneapolis. I can pick on Minneapolis. I'm from there. Uh, it doesn't look like this in those areas. Why? Because in Minneapolis, we have thousands of miles of plains and corn in any direction uh, where things get a little overheated and people just build, 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 and then whoops, we built too much and oh no. So that's what happens when you're in the desert or in the middle of the plains or whatever, right? Um, so comparatively speaking, this is all, all of the stuff here is relatively high appreciation. That's why I like LA. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. So leverage, financial analysis and leverage. We're gonna talk about um, income metrics first and then the impact of leverage on returns. And if you can, this is a, this is probably the most fundamental piece of what I like to talk about. If you can understand how these different concepts relate to each other, they're all interrelated. There's a give and take on every one of them. It might take you a few years, but if you can start to understand that, you're going to be way ahead of everybody else in real estate investing. Okay? So um, these are the most important metrics you're going to need to know from an analysis standpoint. Happy to send this presentation, by the way, if people wanted to, feel free to email me. Um, 
You have your cap rate and your GRM, your debt coverage ratio, your mortgage constant, and your leverage factor. So uh, I'm going to write some of this stuff down because we're going to refer back to it. So who's heard of the cap rate? Okay. GRM, probably less even. One, possibly. Yeah. Great. Let's talk about it. Super useful concept. So mathematically, um, the GRM is also known as the gross rent multiplier. And it is just the price or the value divided by the gross scheduled rents. Remember the gross scheduled rents? That was on our income statement, right? So what we're doing with most of these metrics is just comparing different income statement lines. A lot like managerial accounting, except it's for firms. So um, if we have a $1.5 million property, and I apologize for my atrocious handwriting, that generates $100,000 in gross scheduled rents, then we would say that the GRM is what? 15? Yes. 15, okay, who cares? What does that mean? Yeah, it's a number. You got the math right. Okay, why do I care? Uh, if we think about it, 15 mathematically is the same as 15 divided by one, right? And then if we had the dollar signs back, what we're doing is in this example, we're saying that in this property, we would be, if we bought it for one and a half million and it made $100,000 in gross scheduled rents annually, we would be paying $15 in purchase price for every $1 of annual gross scheduled rents. So it's a revenue multiple. It's like a PE ratio with stocks, right? If you're into stocks, lower the better. I'd rather pay 10 bucks for the dollar of annual revenue than 15. I'd rather not pay 20. But what it does do is it really helps us compare buildings to each other, right? So you hear this all the time on business radio or whatever, like, oh, the earnings multiple of 35. Isn't that kind of ridiculous? When you compare this to other tech companies, uh, maybe, I don't know, what about forward-looking earnings, all that crap? Same stuff with apartment buildings. Is 15 GRM really justified? Is there upside in this building? How does that compare to other apartment buildings that sold in the area? It's a really great comparison metric. And we use this when we do the comparable uh, sales to identify whether a deal is a good deal or not. Cap rate is very similar. It's the other, um, it's just with uh, net income instead of gross scheduled rents. So the cap rate is the net operating income or NLI divided by the price or value. So this same property probably spits off 65,000 in NOI and it's still 100, it's 1.5 million. So we would say that this is a 4.3% cap rate. So the difference is the NOI, remember, is after our operating expenses. So it's gross scheduled income, 100 grand, minus 35% operating expenses, which is a great rule of thumb, by the way, for operating expenses. 35% of the gross scheduled rents is pretty normal. Every building is different, but that's a good one for the cocktail napkin math. And um, so 65,000 divided by 1.5 million is 4.3%. So what's another way of looking at this? This another way of looking at this is if I put 1.5 million, if I just buy the building all cash, I make 4.3% on my money in cash flow. So the cap rate is an expression of yield on total capital, yield on total cost. And anytime you're expressing value with yield, it's really useful for comparing this investment to other investments. So the cap rate is great for comparing apartment buildings to treasury bonds, debt investments, dividend paying stocks, private equity deals, multifamily to retail, whatever. Really useful for that because it's an expression of your yield on your capital. Um, and if you think about it, you want the cap rate to be higher than better, right? That same 65,000, we would rather pay less for that building. Uh, we'd rather have more NOI for the same one and a half million bucks. So the higher the better to the cap rate. Does that make sense? It's the same as your cash on cash return if you buy with no debt. 
but it's that's not really what it's used for. It's used to value buildings and understand risk, which we're going to get into in a minute. So these are probably the two most useful. The next one is the debt coverage ratio, which is also critical, but this comes down to financing. So the debt coverage ratio is the DCR. And the math on the debt coverage ratio is right here. It's that same NOI divided by your debt service, or DS, your annual mortgage payments. And that spits out a number. Most loan programs want your debt coverage ratio to be greater than or equal to a 1.20. So let's think about that conceptually. What does that mean? If our net operating income divided by the annual mortgage payments is 1.20, another way of looking at that is our NOI is 120% of our annual mortgage payments. So what does that mean for the bank? Less risky. Yeah. The bank's got some cushioning here. The bank, after their underwriting, thinks you have 20% on top of the NOI to pay the mortgage payments. I'm comfortable making this loan. If you go to them and you say, I would like uh, a loan, please, for this amount, and they calculate the underwriting and the debt coverage ratio is a 0.8, if you had money to lend, would you do that deal? Probably not. <laughs> right? So that's what they're doing. When you do commercial loan underwriting, you're doing debt coverage ratio underwriting. And lenders are only loaning you enough money that they think the asset will support on an ongoing basis. So it's like a business loan. The same type of underwriting is done if you have a company or a business and you're not buying real estate. They, it's all about the cash flows. The cash flow has to be enough to support the debt. Yes, sir. What's an average take value DCR? Average DCR is 1.2. Almost every loan program goes with 1.2, but it depends on asset classes. Like I said, retail is harder to finance. I'm trying to refinance one of my retail buildings right now, and the lowest um, DCR I can find is 1.25. So that means on that deal, the lenders want me to have a 125% of the debt service in my NOI, which means consequentially, here's the interrelated concept, I can't borrow as much on that building. And because interest rates are worse on retail than multifamily, my debt service is higher because I can only borrow at 6.75 instead of six. So because my interest rate is higher, my debt service is higher, and because the debt coverage ratio requirement is higher, both, both of those reasons result in less leverage for me, which is a bummer. But lenders see that asset class as more risky than apartment buildings, rightfully so, because apartment buildings are super commoditized, basic human need, they're pretty comfortable that I'm going to be able to keep it filled. Whereas my restaurant, maybe not. You know? Yes? I have a question on the GRM. Um, I missed that note where you said, with, with this example where it's $15, what does that mean? What yeah. Does, what so this, I was just trying to explain what it means. The, right. the actual GRM in this example is just 15. So we would say it's a 15 multiple on revenue. And another a way to make that make sense is to imagine you're paying $15 in purchase price, if we come back to the equation, for every $1 in revenue annually. And so the lower the, the, lower the better. better. I wanna get a better deal on that dollar of annual revenue if possible. So I might you know, do my comps and say, oh, I don't like it at 15 GRM, I'll pay you 14 GRM. And if I pay 14 GRM, I'm offering 1.4 million on the property instead of 1.5. And what's like in today's um, world, what's a good number to like try to? I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> Great question. Uh, other questions on debt coverage ratio. Super important. Um, this is different from debt to income ratio, which is what they use when they're underwriting one to four unit properties. The debt to income ratio incorporates the borrower's income as well as the property's income. The debt coverage ratio only incorporates the property's income. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, if you're a super high income individual and you want to buy an apartment building and you're used to buying houses, you could go to the lender and say, hey, you know, I make a million bucks a year. So, you know, you can lend me 80% 80, 80 on this big deal, right? And the lender's going to be like, no, debt services to 50% LTV. That's what we'll loan you. And you'd be like, what the hell? I'm used to getting 80% on everything I buy because I make all this money. 
Uh, on the other hand, if you are living on passive income from your apartment building, then you write everything off and your tax returns are negative, but you happen to have a million dollars to put down on a property, you can go to the lender and say, hey, I lose money every year, but uh, I got a million bucks. What will you loan me? And they say, well, the property debt services to a 1.2 debt coverage ratio will loan you 50% or whatever the math dictates. So this is where you want to be, especially when you're moving towards living off of your um, investments because you're not going to have a job anymore and you're going to write everything off. You're going to make no money and that's cool. Debt coverage ratio also, this is why everybody's in trouble, right? Not everybody. A lot of people are in trouble right now. So people went and got loans when interest rates were at three and a half percent. And when you get, when you do the mortgage payment math on a three and a half percent loan, it's really easy to hit the debt coverage ratio of 120, right? Because the debt service payments are so low. So the denominator is low. So that means that on the same NOI, on the same building, you could borrow a lot more two years ago. Today at 6%, the loan suddenly reset or it's got a balloon payment and the lender's doing the same math and they're saying, well, at 6%, and the 120 debt coverage ratio hasn't changed, but at 6%, your, your building only supports 50% LTV and you borrowed 70. So um, I can't refinance you. So we get back to that forced selling conversation, which we're seeing play out right now in the market. Yes. You're saying a lot of people are in trouble right now, but why would their loans be um, need, needing to be refinanced if it's only been four years? Yeah, so uh, because the commercial loans generally are only fixed for three, five, or seven years. But so everyone that- It is the point of production. We're right there. So a lot of people took out three-year money, including myself, in 2020 and 21. So all those are, resetting right now or already have. Three-year fixed have pretty much already run out. My last three-year fix is running out at the end of this year. Uh, and I have to refinance it. The five-year fix are only beginning. We're only starting to look at that because yeah, 2020, five years on. And the five-year fix were the most common. So there's a whole big tranche of money that needs to be refinanced starting in 25 and going into 26. We haven't even seen that distress yet. We've only seen the bridge loan money, which is shorter term. The bridge loan, the bridge loans were generally uh, either resetting or due in 18 to 24 months. So we've already seen a lot of that damage, but those weren't as common. And we're kind of in the middle of seeing the three-year money being refinanced. The five-year money, which I think is the biggest tranche, at least locally, is not here. So we'll see what happens. Great question. Yes, sir. Good way to know that our deed drops have a uh, detail on how much of that is multi family versus commercial versus single family. Uh, we could get it, yeah. Um, CoStar has that kind of data and we have that subscription for it. Um, the answer is it's way more complicated though, because each asset class <clears throat> has completely different norms in their financing. So, first of all, all one to four unit properties, most of them got 30 year fixed loans with no prepayment penalties. So this distress that's present in some of the multifamily space is not there at all in single family. In fact, those people that got those loans on single family are what's causing the values to go up so much right now because of that lock-in effect. They have 30 year fixed loans at 2.9 and they've got six kids in a two bedroom house and they're not moving, you know, and a family that needs a starter home wants to move into there and they can't have it. So we have this, crazy market for single family homes where they've kept appreciating, even though rates went up into the sevens. That's why that's happening. In multifamily, we have all this resets going down. So the opposite happened and we've had a lot of distress and values are down 20%. In office, the loans were generally fixed for longer terms. So in office, there was a lot of CMBS debt, which is way more complicated. Um, there was uh, a lot of like life insurance companies and stuff, just different. The debt terms on office were totally different. And those typically had like 10 or 15 year maturities. And then those had balloon payments. So coincidentally, a lot of those loans are coming due right now. But that's been a slow building catastrophe for a long time. And that's as a result of the work from home thing, not as a result of interest rates necessarily. Office building occupancy is a bigger problem than 
where the interest rates are, although that's contributing to the problem as well with office buildings. So it's different. It's totally different in every asset class. Um, multifamily is really the one. I mean, that's what I see every day. So I know the loan terms really familiar. I'm really familiar with the loan terms there. So that's where I know we've got this three year, this five year, this seven year money. Um, yeah, retail, sort of different, office, industrial are different. So each asset class is totally different in the financing options. Great question. It's not, commercial real estate finance is way more fragmented than residential, fi residential finance is like pretty much all the same. You have mortgage brokers, they originate these loans, they resell them to Fannie and Freddie and it is what it is. It's all 30 year fixed. It's at whatever it is today, six and a half percent or something. Um, much easier. I don't know what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> That's not me, right? This one I'll see. Uh, okay, so we have the debt coverage ratio. So super, super important stuff. Does everybody understand how this works? This is like the reason all this crap is going on right now in the market is the debt coverage ratio. <laughs> um, so, and, and to being conservative, you know, the more you put down, the higher your debt coverage ratio is on your deal, the less likely you're going to be in trouble when you need to refinance, right? All that kind of stuff. Um, so these are the three most important metrics that you can use to analyze properties against each other. Um, there's another one called the mortgage constant, which is a little bit more um, esoteric. And that is just an expression of the dollars that you pay in debt service um, as a percentage of the, um, of the total loan. And that's a way you can analyze whether something's gonna have positive operating leverage or not. Um, so it's kind of complicated, I won't get into that so much. But the other one I want you to understand is called the leverage factor. So the leverage factor is the inverse of the percentage down. So let's look at that real quick. Or the leverage ratio. So kind of confusing, but if you think about it, if you buy a property with 25% down and you borrow the rest, you borrow the 75%, you have one quarter of the building's value in equity, right? So the, the inverse of the percentage down in that case, if your percentage down is 25, the inverse of 25% is four. And so what that does is that multiplies um, your appreciation rate of, on, from the market by the leverage factor. So this is how people make tons and tons of money from appreciation on real estate. Should I plug my computer in? Yeah, I'm not gonna do that yet. I'm just trying to figure it out right now. We might lose the Zoom folks on this, but... <clears throat> Like You're all screen share on me. Um, yeah, I'll just screen share. I'm, I'm in the Zoom meeting actually. access. All good. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's all good. I think I have a battery. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, good. Okay, it's out of the way. All right. So, um, inverse of the percentage equity for leverage factor. That's what multiplies the appreciation rate you see on that 50 year chart that we were looking at, the equal crazy returns. And then we had the mortgage constant. So I won't go in, I won't confuse you with that. So regarding the leverage factor, this is the cocktail napkin trick that makes people so much money investing in real estate. Leverage appreciation multiplies your return on the market-based appreciation, depending on how much you put down on the deal relative to the value of the property. So to make a really simple example, the idea is, you only have a little bit of your money in the deal, but a lot of the bank's money in the deal. When the property goes up in value though, 
the bank doesn't get any of that appreciation. It's all yours. Because you took the risk to buy the property, you have to manage it, you have to collect the rents, you got to fix the leaks, all that kind of stuff, right? So um, <clears throat> if we had 500 grand to invest and we just plopped it down and bought a condo for 500,000 somewhere to rent out because our dad was a bankruptcy attorney and he said, all oh, that's bad and you buy a cash, if you can buy a cash, definitely have it in my house. Uh, took me a while to frame around, but I convinced him on the debt topic eventually. So we could buy all cash for 500,000. If we say that our average appreciation uh, in year one is gonna be 5%, so that's less than that 6.3% 56 year average we were looking at. If that's $25,000, value in year two is 525. And our ROE or return on equity from appreciation is just the appreciation we made divided by the down payment. Now in this example, the down payment is the same as the purchase price because we bought it all cash, right? So it's $25,000 divided by 500 grand. Surprise, surprise, 5%. Easy, right? No leverage. If we use leverage and we put 500 grand down and we buy a $2 million building and we borrow 1.5 million or 75% to buy it, and we make sure that whatever $2 million building we buy generates enough rents to pay the debt service on our loan, the $2 million building also goes up in 5%, just like the $500,000 condo, probably more, because uh, condos don't go up that much. But anyway, uh, it goes up at $100,000 in year one. It's worth $2.1 million in year two. And the math is the same, $100,000, but divided by our down payment, $500,000, not divided by our purchase price because we only have 500,000 in the deal. So the return on our money invested from appreciation is 20%. So we meet 20% because of leveraged appreciation, just because we bought the building with a loan. So we have 20% from appreciation, plus we have our income statement and cash flow that we said a normal cash return is about 5%. We're already at 25%. So to those of you who thought I was crazy to put that chart up that started at 20% returns, we're already at 25. We haven't even accounted for principal pay down or tax benefits. Things are getting nutty, right? We're doing well. So this is leveraged appreciation. This, this is like the dumbest, simplest concept that so many people don't understand about real estate. This is why people make so much money. When you combine this with a broken out of battery clicker, amazing things happen. Let's try it again. There we go. When you combine this with this, that's what makes the magic. So if you have a very strong long-term trend of up and to the right in an area like Southern California, and you apply leverage appreciation to it, you do really well. If you apply too much leverage and you get yourself in trouble here, you lose all your money. So, <laughs> This is the balance that you have to strike. What's your comfort level? What do your reserves look like? How well capitalized are you? How aggressive is your purchase? Where are your tenants gonna be? Where are you buying? What's the predictability of the income stream from the tenants? You know, am I like renting an industrial warehouse to a marijuana company that could be illegal tomorrow? Or do I have an apartment building that is full of people that need a place to live? Good call. Um, <clears throat> So this is what makes this work so well over a long period of time. If you do this in an area where the value just does this, you're playing the timing game and you can, you can get yourself in big trouble if you take on too much leverage and you hit a down cycle, it might never come back to where it needed to be. So speculative investing combined with lots of leverage, that's a great way to go bankrupt. <laughs> Ask many developers. <laughs> uh, questions on leverage appreciation. This is like the main thing that makes real estate investors so much money, long-term investors so much money. Does this make sense? Cool. Um, all right, debt coverage ratio analysis. Oh, I stole my own thunder. So we did it already uh, on the board. 1.2 or greater, that's how they do commercial loan underwriting. Gotta hit it or no deal, no loan. All right, should we look at a little example, put it to real life? I can see that the heavy eyelids. Okay. This is a beautiful, if I may say so myself, six unit property in Long Beach. It's one of mine. Uh, it's super basic. It's a little box built in the 1940s, I think, maybe the 50s. It's, uh, it's in Long Beach, it's about 3,500 square feet. It's six one bedroom units, 
totally basic, a few garages in the back. And the gross scheduled income on this property is $133,000 from those six units. So that's six units times, it's like around 17, 1800 in rent for each one times 12. That's the gross scheduled income. Uh, so we are gonna mess around with this and we're gonna figure out if it makes sense. Should we buy this building? It's listed for sale at $1.5 million. Bad deal or good deal? We don't have the information yet to decide, but we're going to find out, okay? Let's have a look. All right. So we're going to start entering uh, some, some of these basic metrics into a super, super simple worksheet. You can program this yourself if you want. Um, you can do it on the board. I can send it to you if you feel so inclined. Let's do the gross schedule rents. 133000 and we have a price, 1.5 million. There we are. And we don't know anything else yet. Bigger. How's that? Hey. All right, let's play around. So, we talked about our income statement before. What's a good vacancy allowance that we should use here? One more time? 5%. 5%? 5% is good. So negative 0 0.05 times gross scheduled rents. Okay, so we're gonna lose 6,600 a year in vacancy. Um, other income, there's garage and laundry, but we'll, let's just say it's wrapped into the 133,000. We don't need to get too fancy here. So our effective gross income is 126. What about expenses? What's a good number for expenses to estimate? 35% of the income, perhaps? I don't expect you to remember that. Let's try it. 35 times effective gross income. Uh, oh, we need a negative there. So our NOI is 82,127. Remember that's before mortgage payments. Now, how are we going to finance this puppy? How much do you want to borrow? 80%? Let's borrow, let's just go nuts. Let's borrow 80%. All right, let's see here. Loan amount equals 0.8 times purchase price. We don't need to sense it. Okay, <clears throat> we're borrowing 1.2 million. What interest rate are we getting on our loan? Six? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> loan shark. Okay, 30 year AM is pretty normal. There's our payment. 300 grand down. Payment is 8,000 bucks. And, uh, <laughs> 70, 78. It's not even giving me a negative number. My spreadsheet got wonky. There we go. Let's try it again. We got it to work. Okay. Let's talk about this deal. Does this look good to you? Okay. We're borrowing 80% at 7% to buy a $1.5 million property that's going to lose us $13,000 a year. Yes. Let's do that. Uh, no, <laughs> not a good idea, right? We're gonna lose over $1,000 a month for the privilege of owning this property. Uh, what else do you notice about this calculus that suggests something about this deal. Anything else in the metrics, perhaps, we're looking at over here? What do you think about this? Yeah, the DCR is low. The DCR is 0.86. So will the bank do this loan? No. no. Even if I'm agreeing to pay them 7%, which is above market today, they won't do it. So what do we have to do? More money down or 
renegotiate the price or reduce expenses. Reduce expenses or get better interest rate, increase the rent. All of these things work. So that's what I'm trying to help. That's what I'm trying to get at with all of this is you can pull all these are interrelated concepts. You can make all these changes to the property uh, or to your financing structure and see what works, right? So what if we got a better deal on the loan? It's 6%, 0.95, we're getting close, closer, still no deal. What if we put a little more down and we just borrow a million? Real close. What if we cut that greedy seller down a bit on price? We're still borrowing a million, so we're gonna take 50 grand off the loan amount. Hey, we got a deal. Look at that. We messed with Excel and convinced ourselves it works now. <laughs> Who's got the down payment? Let's go. <laughs> also be wary of that kind of thing because you can totally convince yourself on Excel that anything is a good deal, even when it's not. But now it works, right? So you can see how manipulating different elements of the deal can make it work or not work. But what, what don't we know yet? based on the information I've given you. Yeah. Appreciation. We don't know the appreciation. Yeah, I mean, we're not gonna know that without modeling that into the future. Uh, what about value? Are we good with 1.45? Everyone good with that? You guys must know Long Beach really well. We have no idea, right? We don't, like, the deal works. Now it pencils, uh, it makes money. We're gonna get the loan. It works, but we don't are we we don't know if we're overpaying or not, right? We we actually don't know value yet. So let's check that out. <clears throat> All right. So there's three approaches to value. Uh, there is, and this is this is different depending on what part of real estate you're looking at. There's the income approach, where you value the property based off the income it generates compared to other buildings in the same market. So that's comparing GRM and cap rate to each other against your property. Um, there's the sales comparison approach. So if you've bought a house or a duplex or a condo, you've used the sales you've 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 used the sales comparison approach. That's what appraisers use for one to four unit properties. Um, that's what Fannie and Freddie wants everybody to use. The sales comparison approach is just the appraiser goes and picks comps and they compare them and adjust them to the subject based on the location, condition, and size. So an identical house in the same condition that sold next door is a perfect comp, and it would tell you what your building is worth one a couple blocks away, maybe on the wrong side of the tracks. It needs a little bit of work, sold for less, but that's fair. So we're going to give a little bit more of an adjustment to the, our subject and so on. Typically that yields like a price per square foot metric. So that's why you always hear about price per square foot when you're talking about like single family homes and flips and stuff like that. Price per square foot is the favorite metric. That boils down to the sales comparison approach. And then you have the cost approach, which is a price estimate based off of the value of the land plus the cost to reconstruct the building minus depreciation. The cost approach is very rarely used in our context, the cost approach is more relevant for like weird specialty properties that you don't know how to value otherwise and stuff like that. Maybe a school, I don't know. Um, we don't usually use the cost approach, but the sales comparison approach, we always use on one to four unit properties. We do plenty of like two to four unit stuff with our company too. Um, but we have to consider the income approach on everything too, because at the end of the day, investors are buying properties for the income they produce. So to me, as an investor, the most relevant approach is the income approach. So that's what we're gonna do here. Um, so in order to do that, we need to understand cap rates in a little more depth. Um, so what really is a cap rate? We know the math, it's this yield number, but all right, great. When higher is better, because we want more cash flow. So if I want as high, if I want a higher cap rate, I'm just gonna open up LoopNet, I'm gonna filter for the highest possible cap rate I can find anywhere in the state of California. You would think so far from what we've learned that that's a great idea because that would get you the highest cash flowing property. Well, what you're probably gonna do is you're gonna end up finding 
some like non-conforming property with illegal units, uh, there's tenants that aren't paying rent way out in the middle of the desert with uh, environmental contamination in the groundwater. The reason you would find that is because that investor, in order to entice somebody to buy that property, has to offer it at an insanely high cap rate because that property is full of problems. Uh, so what a cap rate really is, is, is a representation of that same appreciation versus cash flow trade-off. The higher the cap rate is, the more cash flow you will make if you can achieve it, but the lower the appreciation is going to be, typically. And the reason is, cap rates are a pricing metric. If we say our NOI is 65000 and we know what the market cap rate is, we know what our price is, if we just ignore the price. If we say our NOI is 65000 but investors in Long Beach are only willing to buy at a 6% cap rate, it's going to give me a different price than this, a lower price. So that's how you apply capitalization to the income to arrive at a value. It's the same idea as a bond yield. Has anybody studied that? So bond yield prices behave in an inverse relationship to their yields, right? So at like as treasury yields go down, bond values go up on resale. So if you own a bond that you bought when the 10 year was at five a year ago, it's at 3.85 today, it's gone down, your, your bond has appreciated. Same thing with income properties. If market cap rates go down, your property has appreciated. And what it really is, is an expression of risk. So if we say that the market cap rate in Long Beach for this building is 4.3%, what we're really saying is investors in apartment buildings in Long Beach are willing to accept a 4.3% yield on their capital to place money. In. That yield in Las Vegas, I was looking at some Las Vegas deals for a client last week, is like seven to eight. So investors in Las Vegas are only willing to place money in apartment buildings there in exchange for a yield on their money of seven to eight percent. So that means that multifamily properties in Las Vegas are cheaper than Long Beach. And why? Long Beach is probably going to appreciate more. The building on 500 St. Louis is five blocks to the beach. There's nowhere to build anymore. It's a really nice area. You can walk to the beach. Buildings in Vegas, there's a lot of desert. You can build more, right? It's that same idea of the cap rate, the risk return trade off, appreciation versus cash flow. And you can see that. Does this make sense? The cap rate idea is really confusing for a lot of people. I always try to figure out how that made sense to me, but hopefully it makes sense to see. All right, so here we go. Uh, where the rubber meets the road. This is probably really hard to see. If you want to pull this up on your computers, uh, if you go to buckinghaminvestments.com, market dash research dash dashboard. Or there's also a link for it in the um, in the plan tab at the top. You can manipulate and play with this. So we upload all of our own market research every quarter on these cities to our market research dashboard, and you can filter by quarter or whatever, um, and you can see what the averages are for each one. Um, and this is a nice way to compare where how GRMs and cap rates look over time. This will probably be um, a little more readable in a minute. So this allows us to compare cities to each other. So check this out, Manhattan Beach, 28 and a half. I think this is like 10 years worth of sales, by the way, so we can filter it, but you get the idea, right? Super expensive to buy real estate in Manhattan Beach. Wilmington, 13.7, Harbor City, 14, Carson, 14.7. So areas that you would traditionally think would be very expensive and nice, have a higher GRM and a lower cap rate, Whereas areas that are maybe not quite as desirable are the opposite. So the cap rate in Manhattan Beach is 2.45%. The cap rate in Hermosa Beach is 2.5%, but it's 5% cap rate in Wilmington. So you make more cash flow in Wilmington, but you probably make more appreciation in Manhattan Beach, right? This is what allows us to discover if our little St. Louis deal is a good deal. Uh, so now let's talk about what the interest rates have done to the market over the last two years, because it's been brutal. So this same problem and causing all these people to have issues with financing has A, dried up demand for new purchases because people don't want to catch the falling knife, so to speak, and buy on the way down. And B, caused a lot of people to list properties and then not necessarily be able to sell them. So a lot of people have been waiting on the sidelines. Sellers are thinking, I'm just going to hold on and do nothing. If I don't have to sell, I'm not going to. Buyers are thinking, I don't know how when this is going to end and where the bottom is, so I'm not going to buy. So the result has been 
from uh, early 2021 to uh, the beginning of 2023, volume absolutely crashed. So this is sales volume for multifamily in our area from 335 transactions a quarter to 128, like down 70%, really bad. Rough for the brokerage business. My day job has been hurt. It's a good thing I have properties with a little bit of passive income because uh, that's paying the bills. Uh, we've not been zero, but it's been bad. Uh, and then sure enough, you know, we've been sort of climbing our way back out. Everybody kind of starting to agree. Okay, inflation's under control. Fed's going to start lowering rates. Rates did actually start coming down here and volume's coming back. I'm way busier just in the last like two weeks since Powell came out and said, yes, we're lowering rates in September. My phone's ringing off the hook. It's like buzzing in my pocket right now. Seriously, it's crazy. Uh, sentiment is a very powerful thing with this stuff and what it does to volume. What did it do to GRMs? We went from an average of 19 times gross in this area down to 16. In the, con in the context of our little building here, that means that if this building were at the average of 19, let's say it was, this building would have been worth 1.9 million at the middle of 2022 at the height, and it's gone down by $300,000 and was now worth 1.6. So there's been a lot of price damage in apartment buildings during this time period. A lot of discounting. Um, and then we have this interesting difference between two to four units and five and up. So two to four units are generally much more expensive than five units and above because you can get that 30 year fixed financing and the two to four unit stuff is experiencing that same lock-in effect that we have in the single family stuff because these are all 30 year fixed loans. So people with two to four unit properties are sitting pretty. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to refi. They don't have to sell. They got their 3% 30-year fixed mortgage. I'm not going to do anything. Why would I refi? Why would I sell, right? So low inventory here, high prices. 17.8 times gross has been the average. Last quarter, 3.9% cap rate, $563 a square foot, $512,000 per unit on average. Five unit and up, where we have this just debt based distress going on is half price. So like literally you could have a five unit next door to a four unit and the five unit would be 1.25 million and the four unit will be $2 million. It's ridiculous. You wouldn't think that's how it works, but it does. Pretty funny. 402 bucks for the five units, average GRM of 12.8. I show this slide because we have Long Beach in here. 26 sales. Average GRM of 12.6, average cap rate of 5.2. So that, if that's the market average, do we have what we need now to decide if our little St. Louis deal is a good deal? Everybody got that number in your head? It's a five, it's a six unit building. So 12.6 GRM, 5.2 cap. Everybody remember that? Here we are. Our GRM is 10.9 and our cap rate is 5.7. Good deal, bad deal? Good deal, great deal, buy it. You got a multiple and a half of discount off market and cap rate's way better, right? We should definitely buy that. I should be selling it for more. <laughs> so we can manipulate this around a little bit. Now that we know it's actually not worth 1.45, maybe you could you know, pull a fast one on me and get it. But let's see, let's play with it uh, until the value makes sense. There's 12 times gross. We wanted 12.6, so another, what's that, 1665-ish? There we go. Now we're kind of right down the middle. So the building's actually today probably worth 1.665. We just figured that out. We looked at the research. We got the comps. We're in the right spot. We have the gross scheduled income. We just underwrote our expenses, our debt service, and our um, loan. So that's kind of where it is. That's what the value is. However, now that we're there, it's worth 1.665. Did you notice that the debt coverage ratio didn't change when I changed the price? It's because I didn't change the loan amount. Because <laughs> the building basically only qualifies for a $950,000 loan, period. Because that's how the debt coverage ratio works. So the building's worth 1665. To buy this, you have to put 700 grand down. Kind of a bummer. That's what's going on right now. Because the rate is so high relative to what it used to be, we have to do that. You know, it's like, was that 45% down or something like that? So, uh, but this is this would probably be where this deal would transact if I listed it today. That's probably exactly how it would maybe a little less 
then some of the averages in that GRM number are in really nice areas. It might be more like 12, right? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. How do you find the gross uh, schedule rent? How do you predict that? When you're like looking at buildings yeah. to buy, uh, they would typically be disclosed in the marketing materials. That's like stop number one on any income property listing. Mm -hmm. So if you're on Zillow, Redfin, LoopNet, LoopNet's probably the best site for that that's free, that's consumer facing because it's designed for investment properties. Um, it's going to tell you the gross scheduled rents right up front. And a lot of times there's a downloadable document called an offering memorandum. And that's what you'll get on a piece of property that you're looking to buy. Um, <clears throat> let me show you a little sample. As long as we're on my computer. Here. <clears throat> this is one of our active listings right now. You're selling this here. Um, our company has this listed for sale right now. And so this is our marketing, this is our offering memorandum. This is like the sale brochure. And uh, it's in the title. <laughs> right? That's how important it is. This is a four unit. So um, remember we saw that the GRMs on four units are higher. So it's worth more than my six unit is on income basis. So this is a smaller property but it's probably worth 1.5 million, even though my six unit makes more income and it's only worth 1665. And then um, that's what it looks like. Nicely redone unit. This is a totally remodeled property. Uh, this, you know, kind of just do a little summary. This is GM, there's gross scheduled rents. <clears throat> and you can see we're going right to all these metrics. These metrics are the same metrics you need to know to do business in multifamily real estate. Um, and here's the actual, here's the actual uh, income statement. So this is this an income statement like this should be a part of any listing for an income property. If it's not, you have some questions for the broker. Yes. Uh, I'm curious why the DRMs either um, value moving these growth kind of you only getting one year of this, you know, how many project release. Yeah, great point. So the GRM is like a static metric for analyzing value today. It's not really the metric that you use to forecast and extrapolate the performance of a building into the future. It's useful um, for what you're paying for the property now. So it's kind of a valuation metric necessarily more than a performance metric. Although I know, look in my head that hey, buying something at 13 times gross, it's going to work like this at closing. But we have to ask a lot deeper questions when we're doing due diligence on those properties about is there upside in the rents? Can we take increases over time? Are we already at market? Are the lease contracts for a year? Are they month to month? Are we gonna have vacancy? All those questions have to be answered. Um, and typically when I underwrite a deal, I'm actually gonna do two GRM numbers. I'm gonna do the GRM uh, current, and then I'm gonna do the GRM at market, which you can see this is what we've done here. And that, that's our representation that we think there's a little bit of upside in the rents that you'd be able to capture. And so what that does is then that makes your performance better over the spent over your ownership. So and by the same ticket, the cap rate at closing is 4.9%. If you got it to market, it would go to 5.4%. And then uh, correspondingly, we have two columns, actual and pro forma performance. So right at closing, your NOI on this property is 73,000 bucks. If you capture the rest of the upside, your NOI is like $81,000. So yeah, great question. And that's that totally should be part of your analysis because it may make sense for you to pay a super high GRM if you buy a property that has like a 50% upside in rents. You've got your work cut out for you because you probably have super long-term tenants. The building's probably beat up. Your tenants might not want to move out. So you might have to do cash for keys to entice them to move somewhere else. Then you got to spend 15 grand remodeling the unit. Then you got on your vacancy, then you got to lease it out. But when you do that, you multiply that new rent by whatever your market GRM is from our market study, and you know what value you've created. So that can be really, really powerful, you know? Um, let me illustrate. Like, let's say, this one doesn't have a ton of upside, but let's just say we captured it. So if we have the same sale GRM on this property, at 122,280 gross scheduled rents times what we're buying it for, it's worth one six. 
That's how the, that's why the GRM is so useful to understand in the market. We know if we can get these increases, we just added a hundred thousand dollars in value because we think the market trades at 13.2 multiple. Cool. This is how you put all the stuff into action in real life. All right. We're running low on time, so I'm going to blow through the rest because I think we got the important stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. Inventory. So inventory is a great leading indicator of how the market might be going. So I mentioned this earlier, and we're suddenly having more listings because of problems in debt and people can't refinance. And so inventory has gone up. So look at this. Sure enough. Uh, what is this? November 2021. Inventory super low. Also super low in 2019 before the pandemic broke out. Never really got that high during the pandemic because we got all that free money. And then it's been steadily rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. Inventory rising typically means it's a leading indicator of prices going down because it means the sellers are losing bargaining power and it's shifting towards a buyer's market. So we would expect that that's happening. Looking at this chart as a microcosm, only going back to March of 2018, uh, you might say, we're in for a crash. It's going to go like 2008. The values are going to go down by 30%. Everybody get ready. Lick those chops. It's going to be amazing. Hold on. That's actually how it looked in 2008. So this is where we are here. We zoom out a little bit. It's still, it's up, yes, but uh, not really. We're still at historically very low levels. We've had almost 15 years of super low rate, of super low inventory. We're only not just back to where we were in 2012. Even back in 2004, a normal healthy level of inventory was like a thousand active listings. And then when things got really bad in 2008, we had an average of 3,000 listings on the market at any given time. That's what a crash looks like in inventory. Really good. So, anyway, uh, there's the deal. Do we buy it? Yes. What's the maximum price we're willing to pay? 1665, right? Yep. That's right. Now you know how to figure out you got a good deal. Yes. So as uh, as a real estate brokerage, um, do clients come to you with a property in mind, or are you guys presenting properties to your to your clients? Great question. So the question was: as a broker, do clients come to us with properties in mind, or do we present properties to them? Uh, the answer is it's both. Some clients love. Uh, looking around online, seeing what they can find, you know, hey, I like the look of this one. What's your opinion? How do you think it would perform? Does this one work? What do you think about value? Some clients come in and they're just like, uh, I have no idea what you just said, but that sounds great. Um, I got 200 grand, what should I get? You know, and we do it that way. So uh, everything, every, everything in between. Yeah, good question. Um, I'll blow through the rest because we're running out of time here, but I want to briefly cover how this works. Let's say you're ready to go. You want to buy this six unit in St. Louis. Here's how it works. You write your offer, negotiate back and forth. We agree on terms. We open escrow, we fully executed process. Escrow goes to escrow. Our fully executed contract goes to escrow. We do our due diligence. We have contract contingencies for the sale and we close the deal, okay? So here's kind of how it works, the escrow process, if you haven't done this before. Escrow opens, buyer puts their earnest money deposit into escrow, that's 3% typically of the purchase price. Everything is negotiable though. The escrow company holds the earnest money deposit and that counts towards the down payment at the end of the deal when you close. The earnest money deposit is refundable if you exercise any of your contingencies as a buyer and you need to cancel, you get it back. Uh, then seller delivers all the due diligence materials. So we just looked at a bunch of spreadsheets and market pretty marketing materials on these properties. How am I to know that's not fluff? Uh, you might not. So the seller gives the leases, profit and loss statements, income statements, rent rolls, tenant estoppel certificates, utility bills, all the books and records to the buyer during this time period. The buyer then at that time also conducts their uh, physical inspections. They engage the lender. The lender underwrites everything. Their underwriting informs the debt coverage ratio in the end and what they're going to loan you. And so this is all your due diligence process in here. You're verifying everything that you expected about the deal or not and you're making a decision as to whether it matches what you wanted. You can renegotiate during this time period because you have contingencies. So you could finish this whole process and you could say, hey, you know, um, I didn't realize the roof needed to be replaced and the lender cut me down by hundred grand. Uh, I'm gonna need a haircut uh, on price. So, you know, I want it for 155. 
And the seller could say, nope, too bad, one six six for your, or that's, or walk. And then you could walk, you get your earnest money deposit back, or the seller could say, yes, okay, great, we're good, we waive contingencies, now your money's not refundable, and you close, loan comes in, you got to do. There's typically some negotiation in escrow and everything. <clears throat> A sample of due diligence items, I kind of mentioned this, but leases, tenant notices, rent roll, P&Ls, or income statements, bills, insurance, all that work stuff. That's everything that goes into a due diligence file and more. And then you waive your contingencies as you satisfy yourself with each of these. So the big three contingencies you have is you typically have an investigation contingency, which is sort of your catch-all for everything related to the property, physical inspections, condition of all the major systems, how do the units look, leases, collections, past due balances, evictions, permits, whatever. Um, you can cancel for no reason or any reason during this time period, or you can attempt to renegotiate the deal. You have an appraisal contingency typically that says the building should appraise for what you're buying it for, or you have the right to cancel. And then you have a loan contingency as well that says you're going to get approved for the loan that you put in the contract, and if you don't, you can walk, because you can't close it up the loan probably, right? Um, so that's typically how it works. If you need to exercise any of these, you say, I'm exercising my loan contingency. I couldn't get the loan. I'm walking from the deal. Please send me my earnest money deposit back. Escrow company, deal's done. Once you waive them all, your earnest money is non refundable and you got to close. And if you want to read more, we have a whole bunch of free stuff on our website. Uh, we wrote this basic investment guide in 1971 that's absolutely applicable today. A lot of the stuff in this class was from that. So if you're confused, but you want to read it again, download that. Um, we have a planning guide in there as well. The market studies are all in that uh, dashboard. If you pull, pull that up, and then one of our founders, Marty Stone, wrote a huge uh, book called The Unofficial Guide to Real Estate. I think you can still get it on Amazon, although it's out of print right now, but that's on a lot of like top 10 lists of people. It's like 400 pages. So if you really want to go nuts, grab that. <clears throat> and here's our questions. Do you want to use this or do you want to use